welcome to episode four of an understanding this episode will be by james madison if you like it listen if you don't eat biscuits uh hope you guys enjoy who is james madison james madison is our fourth president and the father of our great united states constitution madison is a very fascinating figure um i would probably say historically speaking in relative comparison to his you know compatriots and his colleagues he's i think how do i explain it like in terms of tier lists for the founding fathers for instance um madison absolutely deserves to be up there um he shapes history in such a cerebral way that we don't really fully understand the significance and importance of james madison's impact to this country and overall to the foundation of this country you know he's relatively unknown in a lot of instances in a lot of ways um of the main like the main founding fathers and becoming presidents that means him and monroe that no one knows about for the most part um most people know james madison that's this guy who just made the constitution he was a president you know and a lot of, like and I think it's interesting when we look at American history where events are tied to people, for instance, and significant events specifically. Like, no one's going to confuse the Civil War with any other president other than Abraham Lincoln or, like, FDR with World War II, for instance. Um, excuse me. Um, but Madison covers a specific period in, in this country's history. You know, you know the, the Constitutional Convention, first... Per, um, um, Secretary of State for Thomas Jefferson and obviously the fourth president during the War of 1812, you know? The Second War of Independence, in my personal view, and a lot of other people's individual perceptions and points of view. James Madison is a little like Jefferson in a lot of instances and in a lot of ways. He's a very complex, I guess, ideologically political thinker and philosophical thinker, you know? I, he's fascinating, is, is interesting, he, he's kind of, he's, he's interesting, because he's kind of boring, and if I'm gonna be 100% honest, in terms of his life story, and, you know, there's only really not much to it, really, until he fully becomes a part of the entire political machine, in which case, he's a part of politics, really, for the, for the most part, from the time he joins the revolution, to literally the, the end of his presidency you know he covers 50 years or so just with him basically being this political influencer and figure that he just he's a part of so many things that it's deeply fascinating and and interesting and i find madison more more fascinating than anything else fundamentally especially when you understand you know just some of the basic philosophical points of how he lived his life and how he came up with a lot of these ideas you know he's influenced like a lot of these the other founding fathers in greek philosophy obviously and other religious principles even though you know even though you know he's much more of a religious freedom kind of guy and um he's probably a little more religious than jefferson um but just depends on, on your personal perspective um madison is one person that when i when i think about him you know i he he's a simple puzzle but he's still a puzzle in a lot of ways in a lot of shape and a lot of form um he's this incredibly intellectual insanely just just when you look at the entirety of what he's able to do during the constitu unlike the constitutional convention it's it's remarkable what he's been able to achieve basically for the most part during the two years from its uh from the convention itself to the actual ratification process it's it's insurmountable I mean, this government doc like literally dictates our lives, and it's the one thing that gives us these freedoms that you know we hold so dear even to this very day that we should never forget about. This man created and basically protected us from, for the most part, I would relatively say. Although the federal government, I don't think any of the founding fathers, even the Federalists, believed that it was ever going to get this big and this prominent and powerful. But still, it's undeniable that. He has functionally created a republic and a government like this that has really not only shaped this country, but the world. I mean, many people who have their own type of federal government really is built off the foundation of this for the most part. 
I think that's really interesting and fascinating. James Madison is like Jefferson in many ways in terms of maybe writing one of the, like probably some of the most single important documents in world history that functionally would end up changing the world for better or worse, you know, with Jefferson's Declaration of Independence sparking many revolutions and then Je- the Madison's, you know, constitutional constitution basically just being the fundamental basis for many people's different governments, you know. Madison is a very complicated person, at the very least, in terms of his political philosophy and ideology. And when I mean he's one of the most important, you know, when he covers 50 years of political history, you know, he has so much incredible influence in how politics goes. I mean, he's not, like, the deciding factor, I would say, for the most part, like, being the one to instigate the actual conflicts politically or you know just the cerebral change that we're all wanting or the big moments you know but he's a part of a lot of big moments and his particular influence or sway really changes some courses of history you know most people don't realize that despite him being a democratic republican jeffersonian whatever you want to call it you know he was a federalist at one point the guy created the damn constitution and then he goes against it It's, it's deeply fascinating you know madison I would say specifically is a part of one of the main two, I guess you could say, generations of founding fathers. I would say there's two generations of founding fathers. There's the first generation, you know, like the guys like Washington, Franklin, Adams. They, you know, the the much older guys who would fight in the revolution and effectively do the whole constitutional convention and set up the government. And then Madison is along with like Jefferson, Monroe, uh, even Alexander Hamilton before he died, you know, who were going to be the ones to continue on the legacy of the founding fathers and, you know, continue this this change into the creation of this government to be something for the people, by the people. Madison is complicated, too, in terms of what it means to actually be a president. You know, I mean, his presidency wasn't specifically great or anything. In fact, it was difficult. It was trying, and it wasn't anything to really write home about especially when you look at the entirety of you know the war of 1812 really which consumed his presidency and in a lot of ways it's really unfortunate because i'm i'm very curious to see how i actually would have been a president um had it really um not been wartime you know and i think it's difficult to really assess him as a historical figure i think it's that's probably my biggest issue with james madison so far it's like yes you created the constitution but Other than that, he's basically been put in situations where, you know, it's really difficult to assess, you know, his legacy in many aspects and in many ways. That's why, like, I, I, you know, it's it's people like him that I tend to try and do these deep dives on to really fundamentally and functionally understand. And it's like, how do I understand his presidency when, you know, it was dominated by war with Britain? Or how do I understand his time with Secretary of State when he's doing a lot of things that, you know, Jefferson was doing like like when Quincy Adams was Secretary of State it was very very clear his influence and even Monroe and you know I mean I, I, I tend to question is he this great historical figure aside from just creating you know the most modern form and system of government you know Federalist Papers and all that that's great but you know there's there's a reason why I, I, I think he's just not fondly remembered enough in relative comparison to say Washington, Adams, and Jefferson, you know? He's technically up there in terms of just the overall influence, capability, popularity even, and yet there's something missing with Madison that I think I've been trying to to ponder and to figure out and to just, why is it that his legacy, which when you do the whole deep dive and functionally understand, it's a really deep legacy. It's a big and fascinating legacy because it's more than just the things that he does it's, it's it's how he influences the people around him his wife dolly is just his grand lady technically i would say she's the first first lady you know so what does it mean for for madison legacy you know because I'm, I'm i'm i don't know i don't know i think i should probably start this because i mean 
Jefferson is complicated, but that's more on a personal level. I didn't question his legacy. I don't question the legacies of Washington or Adams or, or their significance and importance, you know? And Madison does a lot of things. And I mean, just for him creating the Constitution alone and the, the trials and tribulations, the leaps and hurdles that he's had to go through, it's incredible and it's immaculate. And I, I don't know, to be honest with you. Because aside from that, a lot of things tend to get cloudy with him, you know? And I just think that, like, so many people have had so many have had so much influence in every aspect of his political career that it's really difficult to parse it out, you know? And no one's perfect, you know? He's a man. He's capable of doing these things, obviously. But what's real and what isn't, you know, is I think the big question with James Madison at the very least, when I try to understand him, his presidency, and his life. And this is more so just about his presidency for the most part, so I hope you guys listen and enjoy. Uh, this one, these episodes from now on are going to be much more really in-depth, so just be ready. Um, and I hope you guys truly enjoy this. So let's start with James Madison's childhood. So, James Madison was born on March 16th. 1751. He's the son of James Madison Sr. and Nellie Conway Madison. Uh, her her family specifically was like this real, I guess, relatively wealthy um, tobacco planting family for the most part in Virginia. And I'll get I'll get to her in just a second. His his family's really fucking interesting. I don't I don't mean to curse, but really interesting. Um, the Madisons, in general, were just one of the most well-known families within Virginia. I mean, other than I would probably say the Randolphs, they were probably—I mean, they were one of the first families in Virginia. His father, or his great-great, how many generations? I don't fucking know. Um, I'd probably say his great-great-grandfather, um, John Madison. He was this English carpenter, and he came to Virginia in 1653. Uh, and basically just took advantage, bought a shit ton of land, and basically made the Virginia plantation, you know, the way it was for the most part, and, um, you know, the couple generations down, um, they basically grew insane amount of wealth, and were pretty bougie, but, you know, I mean, it is what it is, and they were this grand aristocratic family. You have to understand, too, like, he had a lot of family, like, a shit ton of family, like, like, when a lot, like when a lot of people died, for instance, they just ended up remarrying. So he probably had like at least a hundred different cousins, aunts, uncles, trying to keep people's names, you know, um, in in line is pretty pretty difficult. Although in fairness, a lot of people were named the same thing for the most part. Like I mean, most families actually just gave their sons the the great grandfather's names and take, et cetera, et cetera. This is a just a world thing. I mean, I don't even know how many fucking Nicholases there are in Russia that were czars, you know, and. I mean, James Madison, our, our fourth president, is literally James Madison Jr. He took his father's name, for God's sake, you know. So, he was the oldest. He was the firstborn, born in 1751. And he has a very fascinating childhood, I would probably say. Um, he's one of 11, by the way. 10 or 11. Numbers vary. I, 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 I don't know if there's, like, an actual specific count. A lot of books say 11. Some online sources say 10. I'm, I'm probably going to lean towards 11, obviously, because most of the biographies are actually well-researched biographies instead of research articles and whatnot. But, you know, not to bag on the research student. <clears throat> James Madison was born uh, the eldest, 11, I would probably say kids. Six of them that would uh, live into adulthood. And that really, really fucked up James and the family in a lot of ways, especially when, you, I mean, you just lose siblings. It's tough. He lost two in uh, in one year to disease it might have been dysentery i believe and i mean that's that, that that's that's pretty fucking rough um for the most part his father is just like most of the you know really grand aristocratic uh, individuals around that time this big planter one of the most well-known uh, individuals in uh, the county uh, that he was in for the most part which would be um well, because he, he lived in a small place, and then uh, his family moved into what would be known his as the James Madison Jr.'s uh, most well-known home, Montpelier, the estate in uh, Orange County, Virginia, I believe. And, you know, not like, you know, sunglasses and all that. It's Virginia in 1750, 
I think by the time he moved there, it was probably like 1758. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, his father was this justice of the peace. Um, and a really good influential figure in politics, you know, and really just one of the most successful planters and entrepreneurs. I mean, I mean he didn't have a lot of slaves, but he, he had a pretty solid amount of land for the most part. And his family in, in general was just fucking wealthy as shit, so. Um, he basically has a fantastic relationship with his father. I think for the most part, at least in terms of, you know, just the level of relationship that he has with his father, it's kind of brilliant. You know, his father really pushed him to do a lot of awesome shit for the most part. Um, James Madison Jr. would be sick, and I'll explain that later, but he was basically, um, he idolized his father. They would have this really, really close relationship until his, his death, until, uh, in 1801. And, you know, they were solid with each other. They were, fr- they were fond of each other. And James Madison Jr. pushed his father to do everything that he could. He was a good man and a great influence in his uh, son's life. Uh, his mother, Nellie, is probably, I would say, actually a little more influential. Um, I mean, she was basically, she was a little bit quieter. She had a big influence. And, you know, she I mean, she had to raise 11 kids. So she did a lot, or for the most part, 11 kids, you know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, six kids for the most part. Uh, into adulthood so i mean she was this she was his first tutor she was a well-educated woman came from a really strong family and you know she would be a part of his life for quite a long time she lived to be 97 years old what a badass woman right there you ain't gonna take me yet god um she basically educated him really pushed him to do uh, i mean i would say probably his fond of reading and education specifically languages is probably because of her um if she wasn't teaching him she brought in specific tutors to help teach james madison and all the other kids for the most part to have a a real strong education and really you know i think she built a lot of character into james jr i'm just gonna call this fucker jr because uh, senior jr it is what it is um and you know it wasn't like the perfect relationship but it was a very solid mother son relationship and his parents would really be good parents you know and they were always very, and a lot of really strong Virginian fathers and mothers were really on top of their parents, uh, or their kids' education, and their uh, their futures. And when you really look at it, you know, the Madisons, uh, functionally, they're, they're really no different. So those are his parents, and what about his siblings? Um, depends. Um, the, his sisters were really supportive, his younger sisters. Um of James when he was a lot younger and he was pretty remarkably close with a, a lot of his brothers namely uh Ambrose um Ambrose basically he's 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 literally the middle child of the entire family but he would basically be taking over um his the estates for the Madison family when he's basically a congressman doing his constitutional convention thing he's just like yeah I'm gonna go create another you know the the federal government brothers can you take over the plantation and make sure all the crops get done you know and brother's like uh, I mean, that, that that seems really insignificant in relative comparison, brother, but okay, I, I'll, I'll do that, you know, so. He took over for the most part. He did, he did pretty well, uh, for the most part. It's tough. Um, Madison's dealing with a lot of things in his life and his upbringing. And his, his, his upbringing, I think more so than any other president, um, at least the founding father, pres- uh, founding father presidents, uh, maybe a little bit Monroe, is very indicative of his life and his character and uh, who he becomes as a person you know he was when he was born he was very sick i mean like very sick had some breathing problems some lung problems in fact he would actually go to a different college in uh in the future when he's um uh, just for the climate itself just so that it would be much easier on his health um it, it it depends um because he was never big. He's actually our smallest president by a wide margin. Um, height and weight de- varies for the most part, but most people agree upon you know, he's about 5'4", five, 5'3"-ish five, maybe. And um, it's real. It's he's probably never more than 100 pounds, you know? So, like, even if he was accepted into military service, he wouldn't be really doing anything, which would be a little bit difficult. It'd be a bit of a mark on James Madison for the most part for his life, Um that he never really fought or could fight in the military, you know. But he had, he'd have fun with it. Um, he was a relatively easygoing young lad. But, like, I think part of his health and upbringing, for the most part, was uh, just 
a little bit personally induced um, in some ways and shape. Um, you know, he he was a very sickly kid, so he would kind of be a bit of. He's probably the closest thing to a hypochondriac that you know we've ever had as a president and as a political figure. You know, he's like Woody Allen without all the you know problems with his family. Um, but like he he always constantly thought he was gonna die, you know. And you know when you see all your siblings die because of dysentery, you're probably not thinking so fondly and hot of yourself either. So it's a little bit difficult, you know. And it's tough too because you you mix that in with loss. A lot of loss, you know. A lot of people would die around just from sickness, you know. And he really needed the support of his his sisters. His sisters are very strong. I can't think of any of their names at the current moment, but they're very strong. And his little brothers are very supportive. And you know, you want to talk about a real strong, close familial bond? Uh, fam- familial bond. It's probably the Madison family. You know, they they really huddle together. James is such a good older brother especially around that time where he's just think about it, he's probably depressed all the time he's like man eh, i guess i'll be the first emo it's just it's really sh- crappy you know like i have the whole world in front of me my family's rich this well-rounded name and i just don't think I, i'm gonna live long enough to really achieve anything in my life you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know, it's gotta be tough but they all rounded together they all came together strong they were all supportive of one another and because of that, you know, James grew up along with his aristocratic kind of gentleman Virginian upbringing to be a good person, you know, a very disinterested person and really wanted to prove to people that he could be something and always supportive. And like every time every time he failed, he would always really kind of like get back up and, and, and try it again, no matter how hard, especially if you're someone like him with his issues, you know, it's something something really to be proud of. I think, in terms of just showing your true character and strength. That's one thing I do absolutely see in James Madison that I, I do uh, revere in a lot of ways, in a lot of aspects. So, James would go back and forth. He would sometimes go to school and uh, be tutored and, you know, be with his mom and, and study with her. He loved everything, philosophy. He was he loved languages. He would learn numerous languages throughout his entire life. And mathematics, the basic stuff, and... Um, he would actually have a really, really good relationship with, um, uh, a family friend, um, in Donald Robinson. He's actually this, this really Scottish, he's a Scottish schoolmaster. He, he'd be leading the preparatory school for, uh, all the young people trying to go to college. And, you know, Madison really grew to respect him. And I mean, he, he basically learned from Robertson for the better part of, I don't know, two years, five years. It, it, the, it varies for the most part, but he would... I would say about two years. He studies for with him specifically for two years to get him ready to go to college because you know he's fourteen now at this point. Um, uh, uh, in what is it, seventeen sixty eight, seventeen sixty nine? No, no, no. I'm thinking differently. He's about seventeen sixty five for the most part. Uh, he's prepared to to go to college, you know. And around this time, uh, his family's doing well. All his family, you know, et cetera, et cetera, would be doing their you know, school things and whatnot. And he's the first to go to college, and he's trying to decide which college he's going to go to. And he wanted to go to William & Mary. That's, like, the OG school. That's, like, it's my, it's my jam. It's my place. You know what I'm saying? That's that, That's the go-to school, you know, that if you want to learn about philosophy, life, the sciences, that's the way Jefferson, would go, Jefferson went there. Monroe would go there, and numerous others would have the ability to go there. Uh, but James, he, he, he did go there. He went there for a year or at least a couple months, and found that the climate was just really inhospitable to him. A lot of mosquitoes, too. So, like, he's basically just like, uh, uh, you know, I, I've dealt with a lot of health problems, and I don't want to deal with it again anymore. So he ends up deciding he's going to go to New Jersey, uh, the College of New Jersey, which would later be known as uh, Princeton, surprisingly. So before we go into the whole college thing, which I think is another interesting, interesting aspect, is... What is James Madison? Who's James Madison really like? What's his personality like? And it's an interesting personality. He's really, really quiet, reserved. He's very awkward. He's always been awkward. I mean, in fact, when like there's be like parties that uh, Madison would have to attend to, he's so awkward. People did, really just didn't know what, how to talk to him. Really talk. It's a great thing he married Dolly in, in, in the future when he's much older. And because she was just alive at the party and made things a lot easier, uh, probably helped him get become president because of that. Um, he's very interesting, you know, he's very shy, I don't even want to say shy, but he's always just been reserved in general, you know, and just, when I mean quiet, I mean like, 
there's stories of him when he's like on the on the on the actual congressional floor and he's trying to give these big speeches to, to the whole hall and people can't hear him because he's just that quiet you know which is ironic because you know when he when he's doing the whole constitution convention thing there's no one that's going to be fighting for the actual constitution itself other than maybe james madison so and i i, I find that really fascinating and interesting but he's but at the same time it's he's he's interesting because you know it's not like he's not personable he actually i would probably say out of all the founding fathers he's probably one of the more personable ones uh that once you get to know him he's basically just develops lifelong friendships with everybody you know I mean, he kept all the lifelong friendships aside from, say, Hamilton and Washington, but those are more politically based. Uh, that the way they, the reason why, and the reason they ended for the most part. Um, he's a good man, and you know, it, it's interesting because you grow up your entire life thinking you're gonna die, and you know, how do you get to that mindset of where I'm gonna try and conquer the world, you know, and. He'd always, he'd always feel like he's, he's always never going to be in good health. That's always big, been the big problem with uh, James Madison. He's, he's always, in fact, by the time he graduates college, he's going to be in, in some more health problems. But, um, you know, how do you, how do you overcome that? How do you functionally become capable of being someone that's going to be, for the most part, greatness? You know, or capable of greatness. You know, we've only had forty-five presidents in this country's history. You know, well, 44, Grover Cleveland served two non-consecutive terms. But for the most part, how do you how do you do that, you know? Because, like, I see people that try to take themselves from literally, like, the worst places, you know, the worst upbringings, and, you know, how how they become famous and how they become great and become characters and role models that people should follow, I think is really fascinating. And I think Madison, in a lot of ways, is really no exception to that, you know? I mean... In a mindset like that, you know, and that's why his parents are so big and his family's so big and important in that uh, distinction and regard, you know. But when James Madison basically starts getting better, he, he basically pushes himself to do school because his family wants it. He wants it above all else. He loves learning, you know. Maybe I would say probably aside from Jefferson, I don't I don't know if there's another founding father president at the very least that enjoys learning um, really more than him. I mean, he really took to it. In fact, uh, when he does go to college, when he goes to Princeton, he basically does everything. He opens up the, the American Whig Society, debate clubs, which debating back then was really important, really big. It's like joining politics and just being, you know, like, like it, I would probably say the specific reason is because, like, in Greek culture back then, if you debated and you were part of the whole political system for the most part you were really a truly free man and a free individual that could determine your your way in society but I, and i think it's really interesting in greek culture which i'll get to in terms of the the constitution for the most part because he was really really grossly influenced by it um while he's in college you know he he was a, he was a truly brilliant student they didn't really rank you in terms of your academic profile but your social profile and Around this particular time, um, you know, you have to understand too, conceptually, the war is going on, and well, not the war, sorry, the 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 beginnings of the revolution are going on, you know, and I think this is indicative of James, of James Monroe too, where you know there's there's a lot of things happening. People are are a little bit mad. They're protesting. I mean, Monroe would actually be involved in a lot of these protests himself, but you know, James Madison is a young you know, 14, 15 year old kid, stamp acts basically going on. And he's just like, hmm, interesting. And he would actually get a little bit of a revolutionary fervor around this particular time. You know, you're a young 16 year old kid trying to be a rebel a little bit. And, you know, and I think seeing a lot of this really influenced him into that particular ideal. Um, that and his upbringing, I would probably say his father was very politically active. So, so while at Princeton, uh, or New Jersey before fuck Princeton okay um he learns a lot he goes in deep dive of studies you know for for all the problems with James Madison and his historical legacy or how one perceives him he, you're not going to argue the fact that he's this hard working he's, he's a hard working individual sometimes to the detriment of his own health you know imagine being a really sickly person and you stay up just studying constantly and constantly and constantly and his college is interesting um at, at least in terms of education because he learned everything when i mean everything you know i mean everything 
Which was a good thing and a bad thing at the same time because, you know, I mean, back then you should probably learn a, a specific profession, but he never really learned anything, um, at least of substantial significance. He loved history. He loved philosophy. He loved plays. You know, he played a lot of chess there. And, you know, he, I mean, he, I mean like, I mean, how do I explain it? Because, like, he, a lot of people will look at the fact that first off he's prince he's i believe he's princeton's first graduate student so i think that's really fascinating um but you know you you, you learn something specific in order to actually do something for the rest of your life and you know when he studied hebrew a lot of people thought he was going to be a, a minister but he never attempted to really pursue that um he then studied law but he found that really boring really quickly and really didn't do anything with it for the most part and you know for better or worse he when he left college finally he was basically just kind of stuck in a rut not knowing what he wanted to do for the rest of his life because he wanted to do something you know and it's around this time too he's basically just trying to to uh get healthy because by the time he graduates college uh in 1772 uh he he comes home and i mean he's basically just really sick sick as a workhorse some people even said he just was not going to live a long healthy life and you know you hurt your constitution by too close application of study a lot of people uh one of the one of his friends uh bradford had actually written uh to him you know and again he was always sickly dysentery a whole bunch of just a slew of issues for james madison jr and you know he didn't think he was gonna be living that long and it, like when you when you have these bouts throughout your entire life you know it tends to make you think am i really gonna live what's the whole point you know and i think it's a real challenge for james madison jr to really overcome a lot of these things and really a good thing that he was able to because i kind of like having constitutional rights for the most part but it would be very very difficult to for for many reasons um first and foremost is you know, he's he's bedridden for the next two years for the most part while studying. And a lot of the things from his childhood would really come back up. Because, like, you know, he when he was a young kid, he couldn't really go outside all that much because of the weather and sickness. And when he did, you know, he just enjoyed nature. He loved nature. He loved being in the outdoors, you know. And there's still Indian attacks at this point, native attacks um, around this particular point, but not as much. And he had a big fear of those. So, like, just imagine, again, being confined to your room like you were when you were an eight-year-old kid fearing the Indian attacks from the French and Indian War, you know, I think that's, that's really pertinent, um, and it's probably in the back of his mind, but I think this is probably one, the first genuine crossroads moment for, uh, for James Madison Jr., he's really contemplating what he's going to be, am I going to fold, actually, or am I going to do something with my life, and he really, he really stresses for, for the next two years of what he's going to do, I mean, he spends a lot of this time trying to study law, but he just did not care for it, you know, and while he thought it was a good profession, I don't think he saw it as something that was going to make him this great person or someone that was actually going to be a benefit to society, at the very least in comparison to um, a lot of things. Um, so he tries a couple of things and a couple of ideas around, um, for the most part. Um, maybe some public service. Uh, maybe I could try to join the military, although I'm not going to pass anything, really. Maybe I should just stick to being a lawyer and... Ultimately, at the end of the day, he's basically saying a duty to my country and a duty to my people, I think, is the much more important thing than anything else. And in 1770, so in, or sorry, in 1774, he basically gets the opportunity, um, along with his father's uh, influence, to really start his career in public service. You, and many people, I would probably say, this is really the beginning of James Madison changing and shaping this country. So his political career starts. It's fascinating. It, I should probably tell the story, uh, or at least one of the interpretations of the story, um, of how it actually really starts. Because, um, like I said, he's deciding what he's going to do with his life. What am I going to do? Am I going to be this great person? Am I going to be this great individual who's going to do stuff? Because he, he hasn't decided he's going to work in the public service arena technically yet. Um, so he's really trying to decide. He he decides he's going to go to Philadelphia now that he's healthy enough to travel and really free of ailments really for the first time in several years, especially when you just like take a break from it all. A lot you have to understand a lot of people you can only study for so long before you lose your mind. Um, Madison was no different and if you go visit one of his one of his friends and one of his colleagues up in uh, Philadelphia uh, in Boston or not Boston, uh, Massachusetts and 
keep in mind, uh, the, around this time, it's 1774. The Boston Tea Party literally just fucking, like, happened, and the First Continental Congress is convening, and, you know, tensions are high, because once the Boston Tea Party happens, you know, Massachusetts is on fucking a lockdown for the most part. British interference in the, you know, unalienable rights of the citizenry of Massachusetts, and Madison gets such a big first-hand uh, taste to this, um... He basically just gets to see a lot, of, a lot of the things there, and, and the friend he goes to visit is actually the son of a newspaper printer who's like, "Fuck these British people," you know, and he gets a real big, in, <clears throat> real big influence in all of this, and you know, he got to stay and see what the Parliament was like and see what Massachusetts was like, in just under the rule of basically Britain, and for the most part, just and I guess in the, in polite words, seeing the tyranny that. Britain was really doing, and he really started to worry for a second, you know, and he decided he's going to go back to Virginia, and along with his father's influence, and a whole bunch of things coming up, and new committees being formed in Virginia to basically try and figure out, okay, what happens if we go to war, you know, like, a lot of stuff's happening, you know, like, when the next, like, you have to remember, you basically need to remember that by the time he leaves in 1774 and comes back home, like Lexington and Concord will probably happen in like the next eight nine months and early 1775. So I mean, you know, my lord, <laughs> a lot of things are happening. Thing events are transpiring really fucking quickly. So he comes home, and in late 1774, along with his father's help, um, he gets elected into the Orange County uh, Committee of Safety. Um, he's, it, it, I mean, his father's literally a part of the actual committee itself, and he. Uh, recruits his son um, as a junior member. I think James Madison is probably about 23 years old. Um, and he, for the most part, really does his absolute best to try and, and work in this committee and really try to figure out how are we going to do this? How are we going to fight this? Because um, he basically just wanted to do his job for the most part and, and to work in helping uh, basically organize events um, and activities that would help people be able to speak their mind for the most part and do it in obviously a safe way and things are transpiring obviously things are escalating and like concurrently around this particular point in time like you know fucking jefferson and washington they're and john john adams are trying to get virginia into the war itself and you know madison is one of these people that's like very fervently for you know independence in a lot of ways uh, around this time, I don't want to say independence, but at the very least, he's not, he's very anti British uh, in this conjecture and conjecture in his life. To Mas, he's doing good work. He's doing good work. He's getting a name for himself. He's separating himself from his father in a lot of instances, in a lot of ways. I mean, in fact, really, just really fucking soon after, a lot of people are kind of pushing him to be a part of the actual legislature itself for Virginia. And you know, he's a little apprehensive because I think he just wants to do public service. You know, he just wants to help his father and do his thing. But you know, he people are pushing him. They want they want to see him be elected into a, a specific office. And he says, "All right, why, why why the fuck not? Let's just go for it." So he gets elected to the uh, Virginia House of Delegates, which is um, basically kind of like it's basically just just a Congress for the actual state itself, uh, for the most part. It's actually here where uh, Thomas Jefferson really starts to notice him while he's in uh, uh, Philadelphia doing uh, the Constitution. Uh, not Constitution. I'm getting, losing my mind. The Second Constitutional Congress, and you know he's really being he's seeing him. Uh, I mean, around this time too, like Madison's kind of pushing for some legislation for religious freedom at this point. Jefferson's like, oh, all right, I, I see you. I see you, homeboy. You know what I'm saying? You you like that religious freedom too? You know what I'm saying? Okay, okay. Okay, and he basically just kept trying to push a lot of the uh, actual legislation through to get people um, their fundamental, eventually a lot of these things would be constitutional rights, and um, he gained a lot of friends and gained a lot of positive connections from that particular experience, and um, it, it is unfortunate what's about to happen because you can only be elected to really one-year terms for the most part. You had to be constantly re-elected. And let me explain re-election for people back then. You know, it wasn't like ballot boxes or paper votes, you know. It was actually more like a town hall, public town hall kind of thing. And 
I mean, it's literally just people going to bars, getting drunk, and being like, are you going to vote for this guy? I'm like, all right, I raised my hand, yes. Okay, you're elected. You know, that's really effectively how it went for the most part. You know, a lot of towns, a lot of communities, they're all small, so they really don't, you know, not this big thing. So if everyone who's a free man and landowning land person had a say, they would basically go there and be like, I vote for this person. And it's actually kind of a funny story when he's doing his uh, re-election campaign in 1777. Um, his opponent's basically, I forgot his opponent's name, but his opponent's basically just like, hey, man, if you vote for me, I'll give you all fucking beer and, and ale and grog or whatever the fuck they're drinking back then. And everyone's like, uh, okay, yeah, 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 sure. What about you, Madison? You 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 gonna you gonna do that? And Madison's like, I'm not I'm not gonna bribe you guys to do this. And like, I don't know. this guy's coming over here with free drinks, so you know why? Uh, this guy seems pretty cool. You know, he's pretty chill. He's gonna get free drinks. That and Madison was, you know, he was always sickly. I guess you could say, because because the committee itself actually took a lot out of him. And by the time um, he's a part of the legislature, he would still have bouts of 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 illness for the most part um and it'd be really difficult and this would basically be one of the few elections that james madison uh, would actually lose is to the actual virginia legislature so after this loss unfortunately to the virginia legislature um you know, he's obviously a little bit saddened um 1777 still the war is basically in full swing it's in full-blown revolution at this point and, you know, America's losing a couple of losses, unfortunately, with Washington at a, a up north, Battle of Long Island and all that. And, you know, although they would have some victories eventually with Princeton and Trenton and all that, it was a little bit difficult um, uh, for, for Madison to see a lot of this happen, and he really can't do anything. A lot of his family, I don't, I don't want to say a lot of his family, but a lot of people he knew were actually participating in the war, and he just wanted to contribute to the actual war effort itself. Thankfully, though... He is a really popular person for the most part. A lot of people see that he works hard, actually really cares, and is really, really trying. And, you know, despite his small stature for the most part, because, you know, being really small, you're not, you're going to get a lot of shit, especially, especially back then. Like, <laughs> you're this guy, you know, he's the complete opposite of Washington, who's got a solid foot over him in terms of height for the most part. And double his weight at the very least, I'd probably say. But he, he proved a lot of people wrong on this point and I think that's really fascinating because you know a lot of people were really kind of pushing him to go into more political offices and a lot of people were um, helping him at the very least to try and get certain positions one of these people actually surprisingly uh, especially because of their future correspondence and f a very aggressive disagreements with one another is uh, Patrick Henry if you don't know who Patrick Henry is I mean the most he's, he's the guy who basically coined the phrase give me liberty or give me death you know, that badass motherfucker, you know what I'm saying? Uh, he's a very complicated historical figure. But around this particular time, after the whole Virginia legislature and, and Virginia Congress, whatever you want to call it, uh, he, he's, he, he uh, eventually became elected governor. And he actually asked uh, young James Madison to be a part of his governor's council. It's this little um, eight-man group, and it's basically like a cabinet, um, I guess you could say, for you know, like, like the equivalent of like a presidential cabinet, but it's for uh, the governor to basically just, hey, tell me what to do. Is this, this is a good idea? Should we do this legislature? Or should we allow this legislature to happen? And, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then he'd, he'd be here for a little while. He'd basically be using his talents to kind of push a lot of things uh, that he can because the governors for quite a long time, I'd probably say for like 80 years uh, from the start of the revolution to probably around the time of the Civil War, they really didn't have a lot of power. You know, a lot of rich people didn't want to be overseen by a a president or a governor, much less a president or president, much less a governor. So, you know, they didn't want to have that direct oversight against their infringement of their rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even by guys like Patrick Henry, who's like, I because he's going to Patrick Henry's going to be a vehement anti-federalist uh, when the Constitutional Convention arises. I think it's interesting. But he's a part of this this governor's board. And then when Patrick Henry leaves, a uh, young man and future friend and kind of at this point a really good ally is thomas jefferson and they would actually uh, get along very well when jefferson becomes governor of uh, virginia around this particular time although he really really wouldn't wouldn't stay uh very long um he had he had he had actually moved to williamsburg and it was tough for him um he really wanted to do something and really affect change and while he liked being a part of the governor's council 
he felt he could actually do change as a congressman. So very quickly and through more through a lot more um, due diligence for the most part and, and a lot of character. You know, he wasn't this incredibly prominent individual, but he's kind of like the person that's like he's really quiet. And the next thing you know, he's kind of like ends up being in charge just for like random shit, you know, or like like I don't know how to explain. It. It's like how, how did how did he get that? Huh? Oh, interesting. Okay. In a lot of ways, like a Dark Horse congressman, but Dark Horse wouldn't really be prominent until, like, James K. Polk comes in, so, yeah. So, a lot of seats start opening up in the, you know, newly formed, I guess, Continental Congress. So, you know, there's a bunch of opportunities. People would leave a lot to do other things, or they would just get really burnt out and really wouldn't be able to contribute in a meaningful way. I mean... John Adams, for instance, really tried to leave the Continental Congress to just to take a break before getting sent to, to France, which is kind of like a big, ah, what the fuck, you know? And and Jefferson thought being the governor of Virginia would be a much more prominent position. I mean, he was more elected to it and just giving it to him. He's just like, all right, I'll just, if I, get, I guess I'll just join that shit for the most part. And, you know, things are moving fast. People are going to different places and whatnot, and the war is really, really raging on. You know, from 1778 to 1779, when he's a part of the uh, uh, governor's council, and you know he he's very dil- like due diligent. He's doing a lot of things. A lot of people see this. You know, he's there like six, seven days a week, like ten hours a day. Just he's putting work, homie, work. You know, and doing everything he can. You know, he's at the rise of dawn, and you know sleeps very late at night because he's just focusing on trying to get things done. You know, he's very supportive of this revolution and this war effort, and. It's fascinating uh, around this particular time because, like I said, a lot of people see this. And, you know, the, the truth is, is back then, if you were a much more disinterested individual or a hardworking, unbiased person who had conviction, people were more likely to, to vote you into, you know, certain political offices in order to help you achieve, you know, incredible success. And, you know, Madison is no different. He, he ends up getting elected by the Virginia people. You know, Madison, or, or not Madison, um, Jefferson has a big influence on that, and he decides he's going to tell Jefferson, hey, man, I think I could be much more effective in doing this and doing this. And, you know, a lot of it's like Jefferson's kind of happy because then, at the very least, in the constant Congress, um, you know, he's going to have someone who has a, a similar political ideology with him uh, to, to lead, you know, the, the forefront on that. So it's by around 1780. You know, the war is really raging on. It looks like a dead heat up at the north for the most part, and Washington just decides he's going to, combine the troops in the south uh, to take on Cornwallis and many of the contingent soldiers there. And it's around this time, too, that um, with enough sway, James Madison gets elected into the actual Continental Congress. This is a big moment. This is him joining the federal government, and he's going to basically really change shit for the most part. Um, so what happens? Uh, he ends up being a part of this of this constitu- uh Sorry. Okay, I'm really blanking right now. He ends up being a member of this uh, Continental Congress for the next three years. In 1780, um, I believe late 1780, if I'm correct, he ends up, most of his time here really ends up being devoted to a lot of the fundamental rights and principles of, you know, individuals, people, and whatnot. And for him, uh, in particular, uh, you know, the, the ending with Britain... War is going to come to an end in one way or another, um, whether they win or lose. This war is going to be going to be over very soon. So, like, because the war ends, uh, the actual fighting ends in 1781, and most of his time is really trying to figure out what to do with Britain and what to do with Britain, and not only that, but what's going to happen uh, in terms uh, of an a basically just eventual government. I believe he's there trying to help ratify, you know, some form of a Articles of Confederation, um, and. It he basically works hard for this. I'll put it this way, because he understands very, understands very fondly. And I actually want to go into more of the poli- philosoph, like just the actual philosophy of James Madison when we get to the actual Constitutional Convention, because that's just going to make a lot more sense. But he's a big, com- he's a big proponent of the Articles of Confederation, but a big proponent, unfortunately, uh, of you know the, the need of a strong federal government. He knows this very well. He's like. In his mind, he's like, "Look, man, I know the history of Greece. You know they were very strong, and we 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 learned a lot of their philosophies. But they lost to Rome, and basically would be slaves to Rome because they didn't have a strong federal government because everyone's in their own little pockets doing their own little thing, and they couldn't defeat the rising empire for the most part. So, so 
he works hard, greater good, tries to get Virginia to cede claims of land, um, notably like land that would be part of Kentucky um, for basically future um, states for the most part, which is really, really, really big. And a lot of things are happening really at this point for young James Madison. Like, for instance, he falls in love. Uh, and while in Philadelphia, I believe, um, this this lady named Kitty Floyd, she would reject him. It'd be very, 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 very painful. Um, I feel bad for James Madison. I'll, I'll get into that when I talk about Dolly. But it'd be, he, he'd be a low-key incel for a lot of his life, unfortunately. Um, I don't know why I'm bringing this up at the particular moment. I just thought it was really interesting. That, you know, He actually had to propose to this lady, and she said no. And it's just like, ah, oh, man. Yeah, I'm going to be single forever. I'm going to be a virgin forever. Uh. Oh, poor Madison. That's my boy. But for the most part, the, the by the, during his entire time, the specific things that end up happening are him working really hard to try and ratify the Articles of Confederation to give the federal government more states or more power over the states. And it wasn't working. And in fairness, a lot of things are happening. It's like we just got rid of, of this, you know, fucking imperialistic power in Great Britain and you know who was overseeing our lives in every single facet and way and now we're going to let another one but our own people do it like no power corrupts etc etc and Madison really didn't have enough sway for the most part you know and this is where a lot of the the quietness would really come out and really plague him for the rest of his life in terms of just his relative apprehension to it's not that he couldn't challenge people it's just like um it's difficult, I guess you could say. Um, this was not James Madison yet. He was not the James Madison that we know that would be a much more fiery orator. Like, this James Madison is not the James Madison that would be at the Constitutional Convention. Because that James Madison is a fucking fire starter, a barn burner. He's doing everything he can to, to fight for the uh, ratification of the new Constitution. But around this time, the Articles of Confederation, they get ratified in 1781... And Madison just spends most of his time just trying to do what the, the what Virginia wants to do, trying to figure out what Virginia is going to do. And um, unfortunately, the Continental Congress would eventually end in 1783 because there's really no need for them, unfortunately, because the federal government's kind of weak a little bit. And I mean, there would be kind of a Continental Congress, but again, if you were going to have true power, it was going to be in your state legislature. So when this happens and when he ends up uh, leaving the uh, Continental Congress, he goes back to Virginia. He ends up basically coming back and immediately being elected into uh, the Virginia House of Delegates. I mean, he would take some time to really recollect himself and really start learning and really start, I don't want to say coming up with the basis of his, uh, the constitutional, the constitution for the most part he come up with but at the very least a structure of how a potential government would work you know he's always constantly learning like uh, uh like adams and hamilton before him and jefferson he's but really functionally understanding and learning so he starts reading philosophy etc 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 greek history and then eventually gets elected into the virginia state legislature in 1784 so when Madison rejoins the whole Virginia State Legislature, how is the country after the war? Rebuilding. You know, a lot of economies are really just basically broken at this point. Massachusetts is just fucked up to hell. New York's pretty fucked up to hell. I mean, they had basically been under British occupation for the better part of like a half a decade um, during the entirety of this war, and they wouldn't finally leave in 1783. And Virginia's basically doing pretty well for the most part. Other than a lot, other than uh, a cut, like maybe a handful of battles and large scale skirmishes, for the most part, they've been they've been largely untouched, um, despite having the political influences. Like the battles in the north were having like in the north, uh, and the south and the southern battles and theaters were having in like you know the Carolinas for the most part. So it's it's, it's Virginia's pretty chilling right now, and they basically are paying off most of their debt. The biggest problem is unfortunately there's a big national debt, not to mention. You know, you guys are very weak right now. You don't really have a standing army because you guys don't want to have a standing army because less you don't want the standing army to take over the rights of people for the most part, and that's really scary for a lot of individuals, which is why you'd prefer to have militiamen. It's a complicated situation that, you know, Madison sees and a lot of other people see for the most part. You know, when he returned to the uh, uh, Virginia legislature, um, 
he understood the debt and there was a big problem obviously in 1784 but you know he's trying to focus on a lot of a lot of personal liberties um freedom of speech religion um and this is around the time where he's really going back and forth unfortunately with someone he was initially really close with uh and patrick henry patrick henry um ideologically speaking isn't a fascinating point um after the war and independence he's like i want the states to just be the states and whatnot and james madison's like well okay i don't mind the states being the states but at the very same time you know we don't want another superpower to come in because you know france could just come in and fuck us up the russians could come up and fuck us up hell the dutch could come up and fuck us up you know we're we're pretty weak we're pretty maligned and we're not a really united country in any way shape or form this isn't anything this isn't even close to being the united states this is just 13 small countries held together by a small colonial version of the eu you know and like basically you know in a lot of ways, like, Patrick Henry's basically just in opposition to Madison for everything at this point. And this would be the main conflict. And, you know, he's dealing with a lot of things. He's trying to keep his family together, uh, Madison for the most part, you know. And uh, I believe his youngest brother is basically just, like, kind of a loser at this point And really not doing much with his life. He's trying to focus on that. Um, his father's getting older, so he's trying to take over the farm. But Ambrose would effectively take over after that. Um... A lot of things are happening. A lot of things are happening. There's a bit of there's a couple things happening, uprisings happening within you know the country itself. Shays Rebellion would be a big pinnacle moment for this country. Um, people see this, you know, and the debt's rising. And Patrick Henry's over here basically saying that, you know, I don't think we should tax people, et cetera, et cetera, and the states and federal government should be separated the entire time. And you know, Madison's basically like, dude, we gotta like do shit, okay? And he really, and the, their main issue for Henry and Madison was religion. I mean, that's huge back then. You know, it's nowadays it's kind of, uh, I don't want to say a non-issue, but in relative comparison to back then, like, I mean, if you were a Quaker versus an Episcopalian, like, uh, like Madison, I believe, I believe he was a Episcopalian. I'm, I'm trying to remember, um, but yeah, I believe he was an Epis- Episcopalian. Um, that'd be like a huge fucking problem, you know, for a lot of people. Like it would actually tear families apart sometimes. Um, almost tear apart, um, his future wife's family. She, her, cause his future wife's a Quaker and her family basically was like, how dare you marry an Episcopalian, you know? And Madison's just basically like, can we all just love each other? You know what I'm saying, fam? You know, obviously he wasn't like that. It was just more about freedom from it for the most part. He's a very liberty minded individual. And, Patrick Henry was like, you know, Judeo-Christian values, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and, you know, they would have, they would butt heads a lot, and they would really fight each other uh, in a lot of these uh, instances, and at least to to Madison's credit, he wins a lot of these battles, you know, and he actually starts pushing through a lot of the legislation that Jefferson really wanted to put through, you know, um, religious freedom, he really starts pushing for some form of a public schooling option, et cetera, et cetera, just Madison starts winning. Madison starts winning, and unfortunately, he sees a lot of things happening with the greater with the greater government. Why was there a need for a constitutional convention? Why does there have to be a constitution in the United States of America? I would say fundamentally, there's four reasons. Four reasons that I think really shaped the reasons why we uh, had to ratify the Articles of Confederation. These are four very, very big reasons. And from 1784 to 1786, a lot of things transpire around this particular time that Madison is overseeing while doing his his whole fight for, you know, the rights of man for the most part. I mean, like, it's like once he got through the whole legislation for um, basically the separation of church and state and religious freedom uh, against Patrick Henry, he... Uh, really sees a lot of what is happening. This is also actually where I would say he really starts um, tinkering with the idea of uh, government, for the most part, and, and the structure of government. You know, he'd be reading all these books. Jefferson, I believe, is he's in France at this point, and he's sending all these books from, like, Italy, you know, Britain, France, and, you know, books on philosophy, political governments, and, you know, ideas, and and he's basically trying to gain as much knowledge as he possibly can. And I would say the first reason 
for the Constitutional Convention and why it's grossly needed is the most obvious reason. And the biggest reason, I would say, is the debt. The actual national debt is incredibly large. I mean, insanely large, okay? The federal government's broke. It's in debt. I don't know the exact number. Numbers vary. But it's an insurmountable debt that would take, fuck, like decades to effectively pay off. And especially now, even if they were able to pull a lot of people's money, it's it's a problem for the most part. Because along with the debt, the because in order to actually try and pay for the war, the inflation rate for the continental dollar was so overinflated that at this point it's about 50 to 1 in terms of its actual value in currency. That's not going to pay anything off. You know, most people, it was just toilet paper. And every other state had their own dollar still. You know, they wouldn't have a federal currency for quite some time. And it's a real problem because you have to pay off your debts to France, the Dutch Republic, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they, they basically have this a little bit in that particular way, shape, and form. And that's a real fucking problem. Number two is another kind of goes with the economy, too, is trade. You know, I mean, it wasn't just the fact of fear of war um, and protection from other companies, which is number three. I would talk about, I'll say, but I get to that in a second. It was trade. You know, like Britain's still salty. You know, they, they're they basically still one of the big trading com- countries in the world and a whole bunch of different ports and a lot, of, a lot of their different colonies. And they're closing all their ports to us for the most part. It wouldn't be really until like the Jay Treaty or, or um, I forgot which treaty it was, but the Jay Treaty that would actually open things up in terms of trade. And, you know, it's really big that... And, and let's be fair, the colonists were fine with that. They, they, they're not too. They don't want to talk to Britain at any time soon, or any British people, for the most part. And it's still a bit of a salty relationship. That's just the, the honest truth and fact and reality. Um, that being said, it's it's a real problem, okay? And them not having a federal government, uh, for the most part, really figuring out how to talk to other governments and actually communicate to other governments and work out trade deals effectively because it's kind of seen as a bit of a false government i mean it's it's like not like the eu is going to be talking to america no britain's going to like america's going to talk to britain or america's like if if, if, if the roles were reversed it'd be like britain would just talk to just to virginia to trade tobacco and whatnot And, and it's a little bit different in terms of i guess you could say international interstate commerce so it depends i don't know but it it's tough you know, and there has to be some authority that's going to embody all 13 colonies, and and it's a real problem. But number three, too, is, I, I take the back, this is probably the biggest one, that's protection. You know, the federal government needs the power to be able to create an army, to levy taxes in order to protect people, to build up a military industrial complex, whatever you want to fucking call it, you know, but they need to create something for protection. This would be a big problem for Madison when the War of 1812 really comes around, and it would be a real big problem um, for a lot of other presidents and a lot of other times. Most notably, like I would probably say in the 20th century when our military was, after the Vietnam War, kind of at its weakest, and Russia, although Russia had a little more leeway and power in terms of negotiations, I would arguably say. Although that's really debatable at this particular point. And then, you know, Reagan really builds up the fucking military. And Russia's like, ah, shit. Ah, you know. But, for the most part, it's protection. You know, it's like tariffs back then, where a lot of these tariffs were protectionist tariffs for the economy and trade, for the most part. And it's no different, at least with the military, and to protect our interests, to protect us. And, you know, there was a growing fear of raising a continental army that would just be authoritarian, that, you know, the hypothetical leader of this free nation and whatnot would basically be able to levy. You know, we don't want a dictator, you know. And, and unfortunately, there was no constitutional rights for people to really do things. They kind of just had these freedoms... And we're just going to basically have these freedoms regardless with no specific reason. There's no agreed upon issue or thing that the people are basically agreeing upon along with, you know, the government. There is no constitution, you know. And uh, I forgot what the last one is. My brain's... My brain's not working. Um, Oh, yeah, the last one is Shay's Rebellion. Shay's Rebellion is a fascinating one. I think kind of deserves its own episode, but I'll kind of give you a little bit of a, of a brief history of it. Um, it's this uprising that happened in Massachusetts where basically the debt crisis was really 
prominent in the actual uh, uh, state of Massachusetts. Other states were doing faring much better, especially the ones that didn't participate in the war. You know, I think Georgia was doing pretty good. Virginia basically paid off most of its debt um, by the time the Constitution of Congress convenes. But Massachusetts, New York, they're struggling right now. And a whole bunch of people are trying to collect on debts that they really can't pay at the current moment. And it really heats up an attention that really takes place and mostly, I would say, for the better part of like a year. You know, it spills into 1787. That, I would say, is the actual fire, like the lighting of the match that really starts people on, down onto the path of the Constitutional Convention. So how does it start? The, the history of the Constitution... The history of the Constitutional Convention is a little interesting. You know, Madison, Hamilton, I would say to a lesser, actually to a much greater extent in some instances, um, were basically trying to figure out ways we need to do something right now, you know. And, like, we, we can't levy taxes to the state because they're just going to be like, oh, we, we veto this tax, et cetera, et cetera. And... Madison's just trying to figure out what's what to do, what's going to happen. You know, seventeen eighty, let's say hypothetically seventeen eighty five right now. This is when like the the real Kickstarter comes for, I guess you could say, uh, ratifying a new constitution. And Madison's basically thinking to himself, what what can we do to make this happen? And the first thing he thinks of is Washington. You know, Washington's retired at this point for about two years. Washington, like I said before in the first episode, just wants to die. He just wants to be a farmer, live his life, retire. He just wants to plant shit and drink his whiskey and, you know, enjoy the fruits of his labor. But Madison's like, he's sending him letters and shit. Hamilton's sending him letters. A whole bunch of other people are sending him letters. And Madison's the most adamant. He's just like, hey, yo, uh, yeah, bro, Mr. Washington, future first president, can you, like, can you come back, do something? We need to ratify this new constitution. He's like, dude, just don't bother me. Can we Can we please just chill for a second? And Mas- Madison's just basically like, come on, man. Come on, boo. Come on, boo-boo. Come on. You know, and it takes some time. It takes a lot of time. Washington initially accepts, you know, on the, the basis that he doesn't really have to leave Mount Vernon. So he's just like, look, man, if you want to hold a convention, we'll have it on my plantation. That's just how it's going to go. And at first, it's kind of like kind of agreed upon for the most part, but it really quickly goes south because everyone's just like, I like we, Washington's kick ass and we respect the hell out of him, but like, you know, we're all, first off, we don't really want to do this, you know, and it's really difficult for us to really even think about doing this. We don't want to go to Virginia. Let's just, we just want to chill. All the other states are really not happening. And then when Shay's Rebellion really starts happening, everyone's like, oh. Okay, this is this is a real fucking problem. So then they have what is known as the Annapolis Convention, which effectively is it, it, it nothing really happens at the Annapolis Convention other than them basically signifying, okay, we agree upon it because there's only like three states here, or we have like maybe ten representatives from like eight different states that will kind of agree to basically join in this fill in the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in a couple months, and we'll figure it out then because the states rights activist people were there and they were a little bit um apprehensive to them trying to create um a federal government for the most part um the constitutional convention the constitutional convention so um constitutional convention takes place in may of 1787 i believe in philadelphia this entire this this entire time is madison's shining grand achievement first off him and partially to, to hamilton because he's basically trying to pester him so he's, he's it was his closest advisor for the most part at that point of the hamilton and washington didn't really talk to each other for a little bit after the war <clears throat> washington finally because he hears about shay's rebellion and he's like oof this is uh this is pretty rough, y'all. So he ends up basically abdicating and like, all right, if you guys want to, I'll come and spend the next four months in fucking Philadelphia so we can create this constitution for the most part because it's really important to you guys. So Washington joins the Constitutional Convention as the president of the Constitutional Convention. He oversees this. It's kind of funny because no one really remembers this because he actually is the, the president of the Constitutional Convention, but he only speaks like 
two or three times during the entire like four months that they're there for the most part it's really fucking quiet and then again that's just also um just how he is in general so the prelude to this is madison is tr- all the states kind of have to come up with their own interpretation idea of what a new federal government would look like what would it be and what kind of um what kind of things would they propose for the most part um, in terms of the structure of it madison gets a lot of ideas he gets a lot of interpretations from a lot of people he sees part of like john adams's uh interpretation of what a like in, in a sense a republican government could look like um with uh the massachusetts constitution i mean it has you know the, the i believe the two ho- like separate houses and whatnot and a, ju- and a really vigorous judicial system there and it's really interesting um, i think he gains a lot of that from um from uh, massachusetts and that constitution from adams he also gains a lot of it ph- philosophically from a whole bunch of different things let me make it very clear that the government that i think we live in today it's technically a constitutional republic um but i would say we live in a constitutional democracy i think that's probably a much more apt statement because back then we lived in a real constitutional republic and the constitution itself specifically is a document that we all live in heed by but it wasn't specifically to you know the people democracy is more like majority rule we do have certain instances of majority rule within our country itself in terms of our electors that have drastically changed with amendments and just how certain legislation and rights have allowed more freedom and ability to vote within this country itself so first and foremost what is his philosophy i guess i would probably say a lot of things you know he's greatly influenced more so than I think anyone and functionally understands the dangers of the federal government, you know, which is, I think, ironic and why I think it's really e- it was really easy for him to really switch sides to to join the the opposition party for the most part when he uh, ends up becoming a Democratic Republican, for, un- unfortunately. And it's really unfortunate. Uh, um, but he's always been a relative advocate and as like a bit of a necessary evil in a lot of ways, to create the Constitution and the federal government. And he's read all these books. He knows history just about as well as anybody, and specifically Greek history, I would say. He's basically influenced by all the great stories of, like, you know, Sparta, Athens, and all of them. But they all failed. And they all failed because they, were, they can never be truly united in a very conducive way that was going to help benefit them and protect them from the evils of other people or the other imperialistic powers of other people trying to conquer them as life functionally is and it was a real problem and he's trying to figure it out and he ultimately came to the realization that democracy does not work or at the very least the big pratfalls and issues that plague democracy do not work because you know his mindset's like well the 51 percent cannot tell the other 49 percent that hey if the 51 percent agree to jump off a bridge you all have to do it because i'm pretty sure the 49 percent are gonna be really mad you know which is the function of a constitutional republic and it's the it's the biggest reason why we still have an electoral college so you have to understand that people you know a lot of people will say oh majority rule and stuff but at the same time it's like you know for whatever reason if the 51 percent wanted like osama bin laden as president come on come on people you know what i'm saying come on there's there's reasons there's checks and balances and madison's constitution functionally and fundamentally when you really look at the finer details, is surprisingly about all these checks and balances. It's Federalist 10, for fuck's sake, you know? Like, it's incredible the amount of forethought that he had and the capability that he had to create the federal government that we have today. So they all arrive at the Constitutional Convention. Well, let me start off with this. Madison arrives first. In fact, he's the first person there. And everyone's kind of trickling in for the next couple days. And Madison's like, yo, what the fuck? So initially it's supposed to start in like mid-May. But they end up having to postpone it like a week or two so everyone can get there. Let's be honest. Half the people were kind of just like slagging behind because they're like, this is going to be stupid. Why do we have to do this whole constitutional convention thing? And then the other half are dealing with like, unpaved roads because the federal government's not making do or doing anything in the states are basically just lollygagging and just chilling for the most part and they're kind of stupid at this point i'm more 
I'm in between in terms of at the very least ideologically for federal and state, so I don't really care either way. But they're both fucking up in a lot of instances um, today and even back then, you know? So after a couple of... Well, what, first off, what is the Constitutional Convention? A lot. It's basically the convention that's going to ratify the actual Constitution itself. Each state would propose their own interpretation of what the federal government would be, and all the delegates from all the other states would basically just debate each other. They would deliberate on it and all the pros and cons, yay or nay for this, etc., etc., etc. Washington, meanwhile, is just letting it all happen and, and sees a lot of this happening, and pretty sure that's the biggest reason why he becomes a Federalist, because he sees all the problems with the country compounded on with the actual disagreements um, with all the delegates here. You know, everyone's basically writing their speeches. A lot of people are taking notes. No one takes more notes than James Madison during this entire time. I want to make that very clear. He's on it like fucking Sonic, okay? And he's the most f- fervent advocate, okay? He's basically just standing in the room. He's basically just saying, hey, we need to do this because of this and this and this and this and that. And, you know, he's basically just the OG individual, but they're... <laughs> It sucks, too, at that time, because when the Constitutional Convention is happening, it's, it's in the summer. It is hot as balls. They're all sweating like crazy in there, and everyone's just agitated and irritated. And I don't know if James Madison could have been more on it, like Sonic. You know, like, his health problems magically go away because of this, like, because that's how fucking on it he is. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's sick all the time, but I'm just saying that, like, Everyone says that Matt, this is Madison's gleaming moment was during this entire constitutional convention trying to fight for the federal government for the most part. So, what were the problems with... Uh, well, let me start with this. What would, what would you say... What were the biggest problems with the constitution that had people being apprehensive to the reality of the federal government? There's a couple. Uh, first and foremost, obviously the imperial potential and power of the actual federal government to be like, you know, Great Britain, you know, that overtaking of civil liberties and individual rights, which is a really big, big issue. You know, they want, they don't want to do that. And in fact, you know, although the constitution for the most part would protect actual civil liberties and civil rights of the particular individual, um, a lot of people would not ratify until or at least until a, a Bill of Rights was functionally made. So James Madison would eventually make the Bill of Rights, but I'll get to that in a second. And um, it was a real problem, you know? You want to talk about people who are under this lock-in philosophy. They're, they're basically just like, no, we've dealt with another superpower. We don't want another to deal with another fucking authoritarian regime. Let's not do this, okay? So that was the big hurdle that they had to go through, which... Effectively, their answer was the Bill of Rights, um, in some ways. Um, number two was taxes, you know? I mean, it goes along with the authoritarian thing. Um, but for the most part, taxes allow you to do a whole bunch of different things. It's a slippery slope kind of issue. And, goddamn, like, it kind of sucks today. Just imagine being taxed the month. Mon- the founding fathers saw how much we were being taxed today. They probably roll over in their fucking graves. Like, it's staggering how much shit we're being taxed upon it's like in their minds they're like you guys are being taxed for dying jesus christ like it, it's just such an overstep you know and it goes beyond just that it's the overstepping of little things that ultimately would lead to the dissipation of slip of civil liberties for the most part um other thing too was you know a legislative body is great and all but someone needs to lead it and it effectively is the biggest reason why Madison's plan, I would say, is the biggest victor of it all, is a vigorous and lively executive branch, uh, a president, I guess one could say. And and this is a big thing because everyone's kind of pointing to Washington from the get-go to be this kind of presidential figure and this leader of this free nation and whatnot to actually give it some credibility. And, you know, that's the biggest reason why he got such a leg up. Um, I would say the biggest functional issue that I don't think really gets talked about enough is the states themselves. Not, not even just about states' rights, for the most part, because that goes along with the whole civil liberties thing uh, to an extent. Um, but states in general, you know, the biggest issue 
with Madison's plan was the one House of Congress, okay? Because their Congress specifically was based off of population. It's like, it's the House of Representatives. So basically, however many people you have in your particular state depends how many members you're going to have in that particular uh, and specific branch of Congress. And for a lot of people, it's a bit worrisome because, you know, they're going to get their voices drowned out and they don't want Virginia to rule the fucking country, you know? They don't, Rhode Island doesn't want Virginia to rule a fucking country. Georgia doesn't want Virginia to rule the entire country. So, I mean, like, it's a big problem, you know? Um, executive branch and whatnot. So, they're just being underrepresented for the most part. And on top of that, just legislatively, it, it's, it's the same problem today to an extent. Like, you know, like, which I think is, <laughs> it's worked out for the most part pretty well. Uh, which is effectively the creation of the Senate. Uh, the second house that came up with a combination of the actual New Jersey plan, who had two separate houses of Congress for the most part, uh, one being dictated equally of the amount of representative, representatives you're going to have per state, which is two. So regardless of your population, you have two people from that state that are going to serve their specific number of terms, and they're going to be a part and equal for the most part. Which is a big reason why the Senate's always fucking huge, for the most part. So if you have a majority there, you're Gucci, for the most part. And it's worked out incredibly well, I would probably say. Because that means, like, the smaller states and the states that get screwed over really don't have to be dictated today by the insanity of laws in California, New York, etc., etc., you know? And I think it's really important and pertinent that these checks and balances are basically here, and they've for the most part worked and people are still trying to get rid of them it's stupid anyways the creation of this extra checks and balances on the function of the federal government that madison is creating and being argued for by you know john jay hamilton um i think to an extent marshall and madison himself madison speaking for the better part of at least well over 200 times during this four month span over and over and over again taking notes and trying to figure out all the little nuances and details so by the end of this constitutional convention more or less the delegates vote they all for the most part relatively speaking agree upon specifics of the constitution itself so now they have to vote all the people in the legislative debate, they basically get their own vote, and they're trying to ratify it. And officially, they functionally pretty much just ratify it. <laughs> There's no real, real trick or secret for the most part. See, all the all of them ratify the Constitution at the very least that they accept for what that document is. But now the, all the states have to ratify it within their own state for the most part in order for the actual Constitution to be functionally good and strong. And it's really difficult because a lot of the states and their state legislators, they're not good for it. Even states that you think would be okay for it are not okay for it, especially in New York, which is going to be very interesting with what happens next. So they ratify it. They ratify the uh, the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera. At the very least, the federal legislator, le legislative individuals do. They create the Constitution, the executive branch, judicial branch and the legislative branch for the most part they all do their own thing and it wasn't like this in the beginning in fact you know there really wasn't a supreme court until george washington did the whole judiciary act thing and things want to be the way that they are but for the most part they've been able to tweak it for the for the for the most part um tweak little things in order to create the government that we have today to have today so just understand this legislative branch they create the laws. You know, they create all the legislation. The executive branch enforces all these laws, and the the uh, judicial branch, for the most part, interprets all these laws. That's the fundamental function, arguably, of what um, our constitution, our government, really um, is, and how it created. And a lot of people can basically just veto each other, for the most part. It's just checks and balances of what's right, even if it, if it is politically motivated, for the most part. So once it gets ratified and all the states are basically just freaking out because they're like, what the hell? Why do we have to do all this stuff? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in particular, New York is really apprehensive towards uh, the potential uh, 
for this thing to happen. No one's liking it. There's a lot of anti-federalists in New York, surprisingly, and, and in Virginia, too. There's plenty of them. But what happens? So, New York. Young man, Alexander Hamilton, who would basically be the leader of the Federalist Party and the creator of the Federalist Party, one of the, one of the single most important historical figures in this country's history. So during the convention, he starts writing. He gets a bunch of ideas, and he starts writing these essays. He brings on a John Jay in the initial, in the, initially in the beginning. And let me make it very clear. The, the, the creation of the Federalist Papers and the idea of the it's up to interpretation. Some people say Madison started it. I think Hamilton started it, and Madison came along when he came to understand it. Um, they're, they're both in the north. They're all in the, in the north in, in New York and the Philadelphia, Boston area, Massachusetts area. And basically... Uh, Hamilton starts writing these essays on how the government works, and it's dis disseminated into newspapers, and newspapers to all, not first in New York, and then eventually throughout the entire country, under the name Publius, Publius, Publius. Ugh, I'm doing tongue tied. And he writes a couple, and then John Jay writes a couple, and then he would leave and then write one more or something like that. But you know, Madison sees these papers and he's like, damn. This guy's this guy's onto something. Who is this motherfucker? And then Hamilton's like, "Yo, it's me." And Madison and Hamilton are kind of just like, "Okay, let's do this." So Madison joins in in what in his in the specific writings of what would effectively be the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers, by the way, are the actual essays and documentation that we've been using for the better part of the last two hundred years to functionally interpret the Constitution and how we should run our government. And the way that it is intended to be run. <laughs> and the reasons for ratification of the Constitution, obviously, uh, for those specific reasons. So Madison starts writing uh, a couple of them. And, and then he, he goes back to, to, to Virginia soon after while writing uh, some more of these uh, to basically fight for the ratification of the Constitution in Virginia itself. And, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating time. You gotta, you gotta understand too, like everyone's doing their own lives, they're all doing and dealing with their own personal uh, things and whatnot. You know, in terms of family life and um, like Madison, for instance, he's dealing with all his family drama still. It's not, um, it's not really drama. It's not really the most well-known thing, but you know, he's taking care of his family, or he's trying to at the very least, and he's his big name and representative of his family. But he's also dealing with his own health too. He's still sick. You know the 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 Virginia heat and or not the Virginia uh, the Philadelphia heat has been really tough on him, and like this guy is working nonstop, you know he just keeps going and going and going and going and going, and you know he come immediately after starts writing a couple of them comes back to Virginia continues to write a couple of them more. I just want to point out he he writes probably some of the most important uh, articles. I mean, Article 10 of the, or his Federalist Number 10 um, is the interpretation of how the separation of power should function and work. And there's a couple of those that he written, had wrote. Hamilton wrote a lot of them. Hamilton wrote the, the shit ton, the, the bulk worth. Um, Hamilton, I think, wrote at least 50. And Madison wrote about 28, 29, probably a little bit more. I can't think of how many he actually specifically wrote. But ultimately, he ends up going back to Virginia, does his whole thing. He comes with Washington. Washington. He and Washington are basically pretty tight at this point. He, and Washington's looking at him and Hamilton as like his main key advisors on um, how the federal government should act. And Mas and Hamilton gives uh, Washington. It might be Madison. But Madison gives Washington a couple of copies of the Federalist Papers. And you know Washington was already going to be a Federalist and vote for the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera, because he had just been dealing with so much shit during the war that he's like, we gotta do something. And I mean, if that if if he was apprehensive, the Federalist Papers swayed him because he had actually got, got got a couple copies of a, of a couple of the essays themselves, and he's like, "All right, I'm game, homie. Let's do this shit." So they go back to Virginia, and the main issue for a lot of these states is to try and ratify the Constitution within their state soon after. And it takes some time, a lot of debate, a shit ton of debate, and a whole bunch of people abstaining from voting because. They're like, we don't want to do this vote yet until we have all the details out there, until we have all the arguments out there, et cetera, et cetera. And in Virginia, it's a very hotly contested debate for the most part. Um, the, the two, there's basically three parties, I guess you could say. There's the Federalists, Anti-Federalists, and people that don't know what the fuck is going on, okay? 
You know, on the Federalist side, you have Madison, you have Washington. They're arguing vehemently for uh, the ratification of the Constitution. And the people who are anti-Federalists in Virginia, the one leading it, is a much older but still prominent Patrick Henry. And Patrick Henry's still a little bit salty from his defeat and whatnot. He's like, man, you're my homie. I thought we were going to fucking do all this stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, uh, you lost, homie. I I beat you on religious freedom, son. And then... The debates are fierce, you know. For for a long time, these guys fight each other, attacking each other, and and it's tough too because what makes you know Madison beating Patrick Henry the first time was fascinating because Patrick Henry is probably one of the most fierce orators and debaters uh, in the country's history, you know. And the main reason why he won the first time was based off of a fundamental functional argument. So it's a much easier argument for Patrick Henry to basically say we just don't want you know, the federal intervention of our, you know, constitu- or of our rights for the most part, not constitutional rights yet. But, you know, Madison is basically have, if he's going to win in any of these debates, he's going to basically be the kind of guy who's just got to really have his argument sound for the most part, or he's just not going to win. So the debate's fierce. Washington's basically like, what are you doing, Henry? Come on. Come on. And this is where I guess you could say, really in Virginia, where like the, feder- the the idea of a Federalist and an Anti-Federalist really begin to prop up and come up for the most part. The Federalist being obviously for pro-Constitution, Anti-Federalist specifically being anti-Constitution, for obvious reasons. And, you know, people were stuck in their camps for the most part, but then there was a shit ton of people that were really, I don't want to say indecisive, but they wanted to hear all the arguments before they could actually make a, a, a conscientious choice and decision. Most notably, one of them is James Matt, James Monroe, a future friend who literally would vote against it by the way very 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 fascinating so around this time too you know public opinions really really swing the federalist papers uh under the synonym or the, the name alias P- publius publius was uh this roman uh was a greek no roman general a roman person i guess you could say who uh would effectively found uh the roman republic a Roman general who would found the Ro- one of the few people who would found the Roman Republic, and it rarely sways enough opinion in all the colonies, or at least to get enough of the colonies to really begin backing the Constitution itself. So some states are basically just beginning to ratify it left and right, bam, 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 and you need at least uh, effectively like a two thirds majority. So at least nine of the original thirteen colonies have to ratify the Constitution before excuse me, the actual federal government can actually be implemented. And it took some time, but Virginia and Madison and Washington, they would win out. And it was a very close vote for the most part, but Virginia would effectively win their battle in creating the Constitution and creating the federal government as being one of the states to ratify the Constitution. And I'm saying Constitution a lot. (laughs) So once Virginia ratifies the Constitution and nine of the 13 colonies functionally ratify the Constitution, because you have to understand, not all the colonies ratified the Constitution. Um, the last one to ratify it, I believe, in, by 1791, but I'm not sure. And around this point, it's about 1788, 1789, and once the government basically gets ratified and functionally established, Again, things kind of move fast. People try to figure out what the hell they're going to be doing and how things are going to work. So, like, the first elections start being held for, you know, the House of Representatives, Senate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And James Madison, he's decides he's going to run for one of these houses and, and house seats for the state of Virginia. And his opponent, ironically, is uh, James Monroe. Um, and it's actually initially a bit of a, a contested election for the most part between james monroe and james madison they were not f- they, i don't, I don't want to say that they weren't friends at this point because their main companion and friend um and ally really was uh thomas jefferson that really uh, bound them together but they weren't you know by any stretch of the imagination home skillet people um in fact it would actually be a really close election i mean madison would win comfortably but um it did not. It did not initially help their friendship in the very beginning. Not to mention, too, Patrick Henry, really trying to pull all the strings in order to get uh, James Madison not elected. A lot of political partisanship and a lot of political issues. Politics, man. I'm telling you, it's in everything, and it's in things you don't think actually it should be a part of. You know, and that and I, people should 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 know that. Okay. 
So, he's one of Washington's closest advisors. He's a Federalist at this point. And, I mean, Madison wrote fucking George Washington's inaugural uh, speech for the... And in 1789, Washington is elected president, and he is uh, elected into the House of Representatives. And a lot of people have to understand, James Madison at this point is like, what, 36, 37 years old when he gets voted in. He's young in relative comparison. The old guard of founding fathers are still there, so he's not going to be part of the Senate anytime soon. But he's finally and actually within the federal government itself as the uh, the Virginia House representative. Once he's in, he's a Federalist. He helps Washington and Hamilton's for the most part. He's usually on their side uh, in the initial beginnings of... uh, basically Washington's presidency and his close friend Thomas Jefferson comes back whom he had a really strong correspondence with and is a big reason why he ended up going to France uh, as the as as the ambassador he actually he's actually a big reason I would say uh, for him taking the secretary of state ship you know for he's basically pushing to keep everything together because they need every everyone needed Washington to succeed and if Washington was going to ask Jefferson to be a secretary of state the Madison would be like hey man let's just we gotta do this okay we gotta do this Madison would spend the next, what, eight or so years uh, being a House representative uh, for the Congress. Uh, was it eight years? Um, eight years. He would basically serve until uh, uh, Adams' presidency for the most part. What does he do during this time? A lot of things, actually. This is probably one of the most liv- vivacious times of uh, Madison's career, you know? And Madison's a cool person. You know, he's a, actually a pretty funny guy. A lot of self-deprecating humor at times. Um, and, I mean, there's a story about him getting frostbitten on his nose and it left a scar. And he's like, <laughs> this is my war wounds and whatnot. Because he's making fun of the fact that he never found the war and he was a really, really small person. Um, little tip that I might have forgotten to mention. He was actually commissioned as a colonel during uh, the Revolutionary War, but never fought in the war. It was more of an honorary thing. And, you know, he didn't really like that, and he felt like it was just kind of gave people just gave him shit for that, justifiably so. If it felt more like a little nepotistic thing with his father, James Madison Sr. Uh, but for eight years, Madison would functionally shape, and I think had enough influence to really change this country in ways that we don't really process or think about. Um, really, I would say, in, in a real, in a truly realistic way. Here's what I mean, you know. First and foremost, he creates the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights were not created along with the Constitution. It was actually a really rigorous process of a whole bunch of different amendments that were specifically in, in tuned to uh, effectively be the actual functional rights of the citizenry. These unalienable rights that cannot and will not be violated. They will not be infringed. Okay? No matter what. And... You have to remember, well, first off, he's basically writing most of them. He's creating, I think he, along with other people, giving a lot of their input. And and they end up coming with a list of like 189 amendments to start off with. And they were able to whittle that down to 9 and then eventually 10 because they wanted to ensure that, number 10, I believe, is, you know, any rights that the federal government does not levy go right back to the states, which is very, very, very big and important. Madison didn't even want to do this. He didn't want to actually create the Bill of Rights. I mean, it's contested. I think he understood the functionality of creating the Bill of Rights and the necessary need for it in case people don't interpret his Federalist Papers or his work uh, accurately or favorably, you know. And I think he, and the whole the whole reason was just to appease the, appease the states that weren't uh, going to be a part of it or wouldn't join until there was an actual ratification of some form of safeguard and other checks and balances that became the Bill of Rights. So he effectively works hard for the next two years. And that's basically um, his initial uh, purpose, really, is to create the Bill of Rights in the first two years. Um, he would initially vote somewhat Federalist in the very beginning until, you know, the unfortunate reality of partisan politics and what Hamilton and all of them were doing. So the Bill of Rights gets ratified in 1791. And what else does he really functionally do around this uh, specific time? Well, he sees what's happening, and he feels very negative of the direction the country is going. Because uh, by 1790, it's very clear a lot of things are happening that he did not uh, functionally agree with, uh, for the most part. 
because he was basically like, well, then now the states are can be taxed and the federal government can do a whole bunch of different things. And then Hamilton, uh, there's a lot of good and a lot of bad things about Hamilton, and I fucking loved Hamilton, but he was very optimistic. Um, he's very stubborn too at times, uh, almost to a fault, and he's really just blindly goes into things sometimes without really rationally thinking about it. Um, and Hamilton himself had a reputation for a lot of these things. He's a bar and burner too. And when they come up with the idea that the states will basically all, like the federal government is going to take care of the debt of all the states, you know, Madison's basically like, whoa, 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 what are we doing here? What are we doing here, guys? We shouldn't be doing this, you know? I wrote this thing, so we, should, we shouldn't really be doing anything like this. And, you know, it would create the whole backroom deal that would effectively, with Hamilton, Madison, and Jefferson, who Jefferson at this, and Madison at this point is Jefferson's closest ally um, within the actual Congress itself. He's not a full-blown, you know, Democratic Republican yet. But he's starting to creep towards that side, and at the very least, he's you know he's going to be closer to, to Jefferson than anything else because they're homies for life. And that backroom deal basically did two things. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, there was a specific deal that went around and about for uh, the states to actually uh, – for the federal government to take on all the states' debts for the most part, which require them to heavily tax people on tariffs, et cetera, et cetera. And some form of like actual like you know the whiskey tax for instance to take on and pay off the debts of the states and not a lot of people were for that. The most ardent adversary to that was Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was like, we're not. That's not happening at all. Okay, so Thomas Jefferson and being someone who's I mean he he's fr- his fucking best buddy wrote the goddamn Constitution. Um, and they brought him there, and they actually had dinner one time in basically like a pub. and had a meeting to try and work out specific details because Hamilton's like giving his perspective and point of view. And he's just like, look, man, this is – we have to do this. We just got to. What is it going to take for you to allow this to happen and get the people on your p- particular side of the, the growing partisan political divide uh, to really vote and ratify this? And Jefferson basically just says, hey – you give us the capital because the capital was in, uh, God, it was in Philadelphia and then New York, uh, for the meantime. And then Jefferson's basically like, if we can have the capital in the South, if we can put it in in Virginia, in this swamp area that would be known as D.C., the District of Columbia, we'll be amenable to uh, to maybe taking on some some state debt. So they agree to that, and then effectively, all the states basically have their debts taken on by the federal government. And the wash and Washington D.C. officially becomes uh, the the state the, the country's capital. It's around this time too that uh, basically the political ideas and the political parties are really starting to form, you know. And Madison's starting to vote more in line with what would effectively become the Democratic Republican Party. Um, you know, certain little aspects and things like. I mean, a lot of the issues back then are still very pertinent, uh, even later on in the years, even during, like, the Civil War era, where it's like, well, I don't think the federal government should be a part of uh, implementing internal improvements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Because Madison's basically just like, I am a strict constitutional republic individual, and I think we just need enough money in order for a federal government to basically, uh, you know, function and, and work. Because Madison's always been a states rights person. You have to understand that. He's always been a states rights person. But he understood the necessary evil in his mind of a federal government. And a federal government that if worked properly with the right amount of checks and balances. That this could actually work and be something. I don't think he saw what was going to happen like say today for instance. Or you know. And I go in between states rights and federal government. There's a functional need for both. Okay. But. I don't think he foresaw what was going to happen in his particular time. I don't think he saw what Washington and Hamilton were going to be doing. Because once 1791 hits, and Hamilton is fully pushing for what would effectively be uh, the first national bank, that becomes the breaking point for Madison. So Madison and Jefferson... 
can both be attributed for the most part for being the founders of what would effectively become the Democratic Republican Party. And for those of you who don't know who the, what fucking party that is, um, it's basically the predecessors to the uh, Democratic Party in a lot of ways, shape, and form. Um, even the modern Democratic Party to an extent. Uh, but it's the party of Jefferson. And Madison's basically one of the big individuals who participate in it. And Because you have to understand, during this particular time too, Madison's really popular. He's grown in such incredible ways in terms of just national popularity, state popularity. People are kind of just like... Ooh, what's up, Hamilton? Like, some girls are like, what's up, boo? You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying get any girl you wanted. I'm not saying that he's fucking tiny as shit. But you know what? Like, he's getting a much posi- much more positive reputation. Or at the very least, he's more well-known in general and in circles. And at the very least, people love and believe in his phil- uh, political and philosophical ideology and what he represents as a hardworking, strong man with some, you know, weak will tendencies, really quiet. And, I mean... Yeah, for the most part, that's about it. I was going to say feckless, but that's, that's not an appropriate word to say Madison. He was not feckless. That's it's the right, it's the wrong word. But at the very same time, very passive in a lot of instances that didn't come from politics for the most part. For the next couple years, um, really for, I would say a couple years, from like 91 to 94, he's really just adamantly Democratic Republican. I'm basically just going to go fundamentally against uh, everything that Washington and Hamilton represent and what they're trying to do for the most part. And he's really pushing uh, up against them because they're really doing a lot of things. They're trying to do a lot of internal improvements. The National Bank effectively gets created that, that Washington is protecting him. And, ha- and Madison's just like, bro, what the fuck, man? You know, and it's just been really difficult for them to try and reconcile you know the divide between him and washington is really really steep and severe and at this point he and hamilton just are not on speaking terms because he thinks he's a dangerous individual at this particular point in time i mean soon after basically he just cuts washington off which which is which is one of the things that ham that madison would uh functionally uh regret ultimately in his life is uh is cutting washington off and especially the way he did it because he was never able to really reconcile with him which is a little bit sad but it eventually does happen. And around this particular time, too, uh, the, the the moment, I believe, that they that Madison cuts him off is uh, with the Jay Treaty in uh, 90, or 1795. But before that, around this particular time, you know, Madison, he's cool. You know, in Washington or, you know, the Philadelphia, New York area, he's a really prominent and, and you know, well-known figure. Uh to a lot of people there he's going to a bunch of different parties and then at this point he's in his 40s and he's kind of resigned to uh, a life of celibacy and kind of just i might as well just, i'm a virgin for forever so what's the fucking point you know etc 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 you know i mean to, to, in fairness he didn't i don't think he thought he was gonna live past you know 20 so for him to reach 40 is something kind of incredible it's even more ironic because he actually ends up living quite a long time um, so Washington, Martha, would ha- they would have these parties, um, the, like presidential balls and whatnot. And they're start- they were still trying to figure out, you know, obviously how the federal government and how president's supposed to act for the most part, trying to set precedents. And at one of these parties, you know, Madison sees this really fucking insanely beautiful. And I read some documentation and some descriptions of this beautiful woman as voluptuous, you know, uh, terms that would be the, the the equivalent of thick. Um, and this person was a woman named Dolly. Madison fucking falls head over heels for this woman immediately. Like he's just like, you know, cartoon eyes, wolf, how kind of kind of bullshit going on there, and. Um, he asks, uh, at this point, a relatively close friend in Aaron Burr, who is everywhere in history at this point. He's, he's in so many fucking weird moments in, in history that he uh, he actually introduces uh, Dolly to, to James. And immediately they take a liking to each other. She's an inch taller than him, too. I think that's really fascinating. Um, but she likes his gentlemanness, his, his quietness. He's kind of cute. He's basically someone that, you know, when you really look at on the inside, he's just this really sweet person. 
Dolly Mattis, eventually she would marry him in uh, 1794, and her name would be Dolly Madison, and she had a son from a previous marriage, um, and I think named John, and he's based, and she's basically the fucking most polar opposite individual in term, in, just in relative comparison to James. She's loud, she's not quiet, she's very strong, um, pretty opinionated, and she's just basically like this vivacious, lively individual. I mean... I would argue probably her marrying him becomes like a bit of a uh, crossroads moment for James Madison because most people would just, most people only really, like, most people only wanted to talk to James at times because they were able to get to meet Dolly, who's this really beautiful, incredibly vibrant individual. And, like, really assisted in his political career. Uh, in many ways, shape and form, you know, I'll probably talk about Dolly just a little bit more, but just to briefly explain, you know, they have this really tremendously loving and really powerful relationship, and I would say this is one of the more higher presidential love stories, you know, it's probably top 10 for sure, no doubt, um, in terms of the actual love, affection, and care that they had for each other, and, you know, even in old age, they would basically be part of each other's lives in such a strong and compassionate way that, you know, I mean, like, he became a doting stepfather to her child, and, you know, it, it, it takes a lot, even back then, although, if I'm gonna be 100% honest, they were really relatively poor parents, um, did not properly discipline the kid, although, I will say, in fairness, when you're running the country, it's a little bit hard, so, it, it gets tough, uh, in, in comparison, and Dolly, if you don't know who she is, functionally, and why I'm really... Uh, specific about her right now is the reality that she can be generally accepted uh, as the individual that coined the term first lady. She's the one that sets, I think, a lot of precedents. You know how presidential balls go, how people should, you know, coordinate with one another. You know, she's a really incredibly educated, incredibly smart individual. You know, um, she was capable of being in a political debate and conversation, although she chose to really not want to do a lot of those things. She'd rather be a, just a regular doting housewife, surprisingly, but she was okay with just domestic su- success, at the very least, and just supporting her husband. You know, she's a pretty badass woman. I mean, she would eventually save Washington's painting. It's a, it's a long story. Um, but anyways, she's a pretty kick-ass lady and does a whole bunch of things for James that, you know, she's the first lady, technically speaking. I mean, obviously, Martha, Washington, all that, yeah, yeah, but like, you know, Dolly really becomes, like, the OG person. It's like Washington sets the president, but, like, the person that actually does that precedent, technically speaking, for instance, is, like, Thomas Jefferson for, like, the two-term limit, you know. Washington started it, but it really doesn't start the whole succession thing until Jefferson does it. So whatever your opinion of that is, for instance. So he gets married, and his popularity really only grows brighter and stronger at this particular point in time. And he just becomes a really solid individual uh, in a congressional... Like, he becomes the leading opposition to the Federalist Party. And at this point, the Federalist Party is just overtaking um, the entire Congress. And a lot of things are happening in this country. You know, the cotton gin's made, and it's starting to gain prominence in the South specifically. Um, And this country's improving. You know, the economy's really starting to trend in the right direction now that people aren't really functionally in debt and the first bank of, of uh, uh, the first national bank starts creating a lot of money for a lot of people, a lot of different loans and things are looking up. But for the most part, um, it's him in, in the house specifically. And I think Monroe in the Senate at this point, uh, leading the opposition against the Federalist party. And they're against basically everything that happens during from here to both of them are him leaving the office for the most part in a 1797 you know he's against the jay treaty he's against a whole bunch of he's vehemently against the uh, whiskey tax you know and just a lot of shit for the most part and he's aggressively against and uh when and uh, when jefferson ends up leaving office he's basically like well fuck i will lead this party you you can you can chill jefferson and take a break because you got your fucking migraines and shit so what happens uh, when Mattis or when Adams becomes president? It's a little bit complicated because once Adams uh, becomes president, he spends some t- he spends a little bit of time, for the most part, really going against a lot of the things that Adams 
um, really is trying to do. Most notably, like Alien Sedation Acts, you know, which is a really big thing, unfortunately, Matt and Adams' presidency. But eventually, just like Jefferson, just like a lot of people, you know, after a couple years trying to, for the most part, uh, fight Adams, and it's a bit of a losing battle because the Federalists still had a bit of a stranglehold. Because in reality, if the Democratic Republicans had a had a much higher volume of people in Congress, the Alien Sedation Act would have never passed to begin with, uh, which is unfortunate, but it is what it is. It's a losing battle at this point because the Federalists have such a stranglehold on this country, and specifically the North. They have the South locked up for the most part um, in terms of how the country is, and the country's a little bit in a tricky position because you know the taxes the war is not popular the quasi war is not popular and it's a lot to take in for for madison it's a lot to deal with especially after doing this for the better part of 10 years as a house representative you know and it's, and it's just exhausting so madison in 1799 decides he's not going to run for re-election and then ends up deciding he's going to retire and let me make it very clear because when a lot of these people retire they genuinely want to retire, you know, like a lot of people, especially around this time, even nowadays, you know, once you retire, it's just like, I'm done. I want to like, just chill, you know, and I don't think, and let's be fair, a lot of people have, I'm, once you get like politically initiated, it's, I think it's really hard to get out of it now. You know, when you think and learn about politics nowadays, it tends to really grossly influence you and it's really difficult to get out of it and not be a political person, so... You know, and it's tough. But I think Madison is one of the very few people that I think was genuinely ready to retire because a lot of events were going to be happening around this uh, particular time uh, in his life. Um, like things like his father. His father at this point is very, very old. His mother is uh, getting up on there in age. And um, he basically just came home to the family farm. The family farm was still under his, uh, the Montpelier estate was still under his father. And his father would die, unfortunately, in 1801, in which case he, James Madison Jr., being the oldest son, would inherit the estate entirely. And effectively, for the for, for the time being, run part of the plantation, et cetera, et cetera, and really be a big, uh, big part of them, you know, growing cop. He was never really an effective farmer, but he was very adamant and attempted to really try to be an effective farmer. A lot, most of his siblings and uh, Ambrose would basically be the one to run the show for the most part and make it, at least relatively speaking, uh, a profitable venture. At least profitable enough for uh, James Madison's stepson to eventually be a future alcoholic, unfortunately. So, you know, and gambler. And, you know, it's just kind of funny. Like, his, 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 his stepson is the complete opposite of, of Madison in a lot of those regards and respects. So what else does Madison do during this time? He reflects. He thinks about, you know, where is the country headed? You know, what are we? What am I doing? Did I do something wrong? How can we, you know, because the Federalists are basically having a stranglehold, and while the presidential election is effectively going at this point, or it's basically between Jefferson, Burr, Adams, et cetera, et cetera. You know, he he throws his hand in there to support Jefferson in any way that he possibly can, whether it's through some finances, some 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 campaigning, not really campaigning, but like you know, newspaper influence, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Madison, I think, is in a bit of a crossroads at this point too, because you know you have to self reflect sometimes, and when you're on and when you're in this retirement uh, phase that he that he's in right now, he's probably just thinking. Did I do the right thing in attempting to create this government? Because I feel like I'm fucking up right now because we're, lo- we're not looking too hot. Like, really put yourself in his shoes, you know? It's just like in 1787 or 1789, it's like, yeah, we did this. We're creating this government. It's awesome. And then 10 years later, John Adams is being, you know, monarch or uh, banned or uh, marked as a, excuse me, is being marked as like a fucking tyrant and monster. And he's just like... This is exactly the problems that I did not want to do. I did not want to go for. So when the election comes around, I mean, obviously he was always going to support Jefferson. But uh, for the most part, when Jefferson wins, you know, people need to realize when Jefferson wins, that's a big moment for a lot of people because it went, it meant that the party of the people at the people, or at the very least, the the 
the specific leaders that are going to represent the people, you know, is is back, you know. Like, Jefferson's the man of the people, and he's going to represent us as the man of the people. And that was a really big moment for a lot of uh, a lot of United States citizens, you know, and a lot of Americans. And it's around, and immediately, immediately, uh, Jefferson sends word after he wins the election that... Because uh, you have to remember, too, the elect for the, the presidential cabinets and all that, like, the presidential term starts in May, uh, or in March. So when the election comes around, there's like a five, four or five months gap in between. Uh, they wouldn't change that until ne- a later election, I believe, during FDR's term. Um, it was ma- the main purpose was to create less lame duck congressional um, uh, uh, congresses and whatnot. So after some time, Madison gets the word. He kind of reflects for a little bit, and I think and the biggest reason why I think he takes it first off is political gains. He's not going to go. It's an opportunity of a lifetime, really, at this point. And above all else, I think he really wants to kind of try and make change, real change that's going to be sustainable, that's not going to lead to any monarchy. And he thinks that Jefferson and he can really do some stuff. So Jefferson asks him to be his Secretary of State. So in 1801, uh, Madison becomes Jefferson's Secretary of State. And... It's kind of tricky. A lot of people were, I don't want to say a little bit upset by this or the, by this reality. If you hear the dogs in the background, I'm very sorry. Uh, they're kind of old and they're kind of dumb right now and they're just going to keep barking, so I apologize. Anyways, he it's interesting because the Secretary of State shit for him is kind of a bit, bit of a random one. Um, I mean, it's difficult for him because at the very least... The biggest problem with the Secretary of State ship for Madison is he has literally no foreign policy experience, you know. The more realistic individual in that particular capacity probably would have been James Monroe. I mean, at least he was the ambassador and minister to France for the most part. So, it is what it is. Um, but he was chosen partially because, in reality, he was a hardworking man who understands the specific details. He was going to be really just on it like Sonic, working himself to damn near death at, at, a, at a certain point in reality. I'm going to do this in no particular order. Um, Madison's time as the Secretary of State for uh, Thomas Jefferson can be really simplified with four or five specific things that are very pertinent to Jefferson's presidency that he is grossly a part of. And also just, if you want to understand Jefferson's or Madison's time as Secretary of State, he's basically just tied to the, to the hip of Jefferson. He's basically just jefferson's go-to boy for the most part to, to get shit done you know whatever jefferson isn't doing specifically he's basically delegated that to madison to handle uh for the most part and, and in fact it actually reached a point where jefferson's just fucking exhausted from being the, the fucking president and dealing with all this bullshit um i mean in fairness that he caused um at least for a second term uh that madison effectively ends up becoming the president for or at least, the, like, the standing person who's making most of the decisions uh, in the last year or so as, a, uh, as like, the stand-in individual. It's kind of interesting. It's also a big reason why he ends up becoming the heir apparent to, to Jefferson around this, this point in time. This also starts, like, this whole succession line of secretaries of state becoming president because the next two after him, Monroe and, and Quincy Adams, effectively would be... Uh, uh, future presidents after this you know part of it being you know this whole virginia dynasty of presidents um uh, line of succession and whatnot uh leading the country but also just the genuine reality that you know secretary of state's a relatively powerful position and a lot of people want it and want to be a part of it you know you don't hear a lot of secretary of treasuries uh being really president for the most part secretary of the state's going to really effectively assist you in becoming a really good president or at the very least in terms of experience, at the very least, being a president's really complicated and it's really difficult. It takes a lot of characteristics and takes a lot of things into consideration to, to actually being a fucking president. So what is Madison doing during this particular time? Well, first and foremost, his wife, Dolly, is a kick-ass woman. And since Jefferson never remarried and uh, his wife had died much, much early, about 20 years earlier, damn near at this point, um, Dolly effectively becomes the first lady during a jefferson's time period as president uh, she's the stand-in for the most part if not her then it was jefferson's daughter but it's mainly dolly uh, they're always together and uh, madison and jefferson and 
she'd be like the stand-in she'd basically be the first lady for 16 years like it's it's kind of insane and the only other person that was there genuinely longer was eleanor roosevelt but you know it's a little bit different um Madison's time as Secretary of State can really be boiled down to four or five things. I think my, I think my just, I'm just repeating myself at this point. Um, he basically just push and do a lot of the things that Jefferson wanted to do and just support him for the most part in all aspects that he wanted to do, while also playing relatively speaking key roles in uh, the certain most notable things in Jefferson's uh, time as or Madison's time as Secretary of State uh, during his presidency. Obviously, you know, you have the little day-to-day stuff, little stuff that, for the most part, Jefferson was just trying to do in terms of the a booming economy uh, in the first term, at the very least, because he's stopping taxes. People are much happier, uh, for the most part, and things are actually doing pretty good. And while the first bank's kind of just doing their thing, um, you know, it is, it is what it is, for the most part, and people are doing very well, you know. When you, when you lower taxes, you let people do the thing. Oh, go figure that people are much happier and the economy ends up being pretty good. Um, the first thing, or at least the first notable thing that I would always say and what most people would say about Jeff- uh, Jefferson's, pre- Jefferson's presidency is uh, the Louisiana Purchase. You know, Madison has a big, big part of it, you know. I mean, he and he and he's basically just telling Jefferson we gotta do this, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. He's one of the big individuals that's pushing that pushed Monroe to go and uh, meet with the French along with uh, Singleton, who ends up being the real guy to do all the the negotiating and the, and the actual deal and treaty itself. Um, that Madison, <laughs> it's, it's funny. It, it, the main reason why he's so important is because Jefferson struggles with the Louisiana Purchase because he's such a states' rights person that he's like, I don't, I think we need to create another amendment for this. And Madison, he's like, I created the fucking document. You don't need another amendment. Just go buy it. We'll deal with the consequences later. And a lot of people were like, oh, a guest. Oh, you know. And the Madison's like, shut the fuck up. You guys would do the exact same thing, you know. And he's like arguing with people left and right about this, which I think is really, you know, valiant in his efforts. Because um, this is just, if you can get land for effectively like two cents an acre today, which would be like, what, with inflation and all that, like 10 bucks or like five bucks, like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I, you're not hesitating if you can get like just a plot of land, like just a plot of land itself. Like, you know, yeah, I, I have family in rich parts of California, and like the land itself with no home was like worth four hundred thousand dollars. So I mean, it, come on, we're all being realistic. And the Federalists were the ones that are basically just like, oh, gosh, this is horrible, oh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, along with that, he's also uh, during the Barbary Wars, he's basically was one of the people that's really pushing for neutrality uh, during the conflicts with Britain and France and siding with the, with the Dutch and whatnot during, you know, fighting all the pirates and stuff, Arg, you know. It is notable, too, the, the main two things that I think really are pertinent, I would say, to, to Madison's time as Secretary of State. And again, this isn't really no particular order. I'm going to be more in particular of his order, of the order for the most part, um, uh, during uh, his presidency and trying to keep order of that. So I do apologize if this is confusing. Uh, the first notable thing, though, that I would have, I have to point out in terms of Madison's time as uh, Secretary of State is the actual Supreme Court case of Marbury versus Madison. Marbury versus Madison is a fascinating case because the backstory to that, for the most part, and I'm probably going to get some of this wrong, is... You know, during John Adams' his time as president, he's basically trying to appoint a whole bunch of different Federalist judges. And uh, Jefferson, by the time he becomes president, basically just tells those people to fuck off and either fires them and moves them in different positions um, to put in his own people, for the most part, to get uh, power and relative control and, you know, get just get his people in. You know, and it is what it is. And one of these judges that was gifted an opportunity or was supposed to be appointed but didn't get the opportunity to for whatever reason... And that was appointed by uh, um, by Adams uh, was Judge Marbury from Maryland, and 
basically Madison just did not hand the commission over to Marbury when he should have, or at least constitutionally speaking. And it creates a bit of, bit of a hubbub. Marbury's mad. Everyone's all upset. And Madison's like, let's take this to the fucking Supreme Court. And the biggest problem with the Supreme Court is that Thomas Jefferson's second cousin, or cousin, uh, John Marshall, who they basically hate each other, um, effectively is there as the Supreme Court Chief Justice. Marbury versus Madison is the specific case that creates the power that the Supreme Court has. So if you want to thank the Supreme Court for having some atrocious uh, judicial decisions and great du- judicial decisions, you can blame James Madison primarily, technically speaking. You can primarily blame James Madison for that, for not handing the appointment over. Because the court, it's the ruling itself basically said that while... What Madison and Jefferson did was technically and constitutionally not okay. They, they, dec- they basically said that they couldn't really enforce them choosing to do it or, or whatnot. So what, what effectively happened is Madison and Jefferson won out in what they wanted for the most part because they didn't have to point Marbury. But it effectively gave Supreme Court the ability for judicial review, that they can actually interpret the laws and say that they are constitutional or unconstitutional. And that's a really big thing because at that point, it effectively will mess Jefferson and a lot of the Democratic Republicans up until about Andrew Jackson uh, that they have a Federalist Supreme Court judicial system for the most part. I would also say the most other most notable thing, which I think does not get enough credit about for being the one thing that I think is truly the largest blemish on Jefferson's presidency and undoubtedly Madison's time as Secretary of State, and there has to be the Embargo Act of, uh, I believe, 1806 or 1807. Because you have to understand, again, like I probably said with Jefferson, there's a lot of tensions with Great Britain, there's a lot of tensions with France, and Napoleon's fucking everything up at this point. I mean, he's this motherfucker's kidnapping popes left and right. He is basically just trying to dominate and rule everybody. He's pointing his own fucking kings and shit, then naming themselves Napoleon and Bonaparte and all that stuff. And, like, it's he, pointing getting divorce, too, around this particular point in time. It is fascinating. It is incredible. It is also a very sh- fundamentally struggling and rough time in this country's history. So... You know, Madison and the and Jefferson just getting sick of their uh, basically their ships getting looted left and right. British taking the imprisonment of of their sailors for the most part because they think they're British colonists still. You're, uh, British colonists still, you know, and all that. And they basically decide we're gonna hurt them economically because they think that America, in fairness, is a really big uh, economic country for the most part. It's not top. I think at that point in the world. I wouldn't call them top five, but them doing a full-on embargo the way that they were doing was going to have some economic effect. Two problems with it. Because, first off, the Embargo Act itself literally just stops all trade internationally. Just in general. Just stops all trade. Literally stops all trade. I can't say how fucking stupid enough that is. Just stops all trade. And immediately, like, GDP growth and all that, whatever, gross gross domestic product. Like, the economy just gets cut in half within, like, a month. And everyone's losing their fucking minds as people are losing their jobs. Like, nothing's coming in. And Jefferson effectively becomes one of the most unpopular presidents of all time. Sorry, construction going on. And And not to mention, too, that... Although Madison kind of gets away from this, because this would be the only blemish of of his notable career, I would say, is um, is is this embargo act. You know, it, he gets he doesn't get enough blame for being the person that's basically like saying, "Well, we got to do this." You know, I mean, he's the Secretary of State; he's got he's got to have more say and to tell Jefferson, "Hey, we probably shouldn't do this." You know, and you know, he can argue it's probably his idea, unfortunately. So it's a little it's a little extreme. They would eventually, you know, renege on it, and he, I mean, Madison would eventually get rid of it entirely for the most part. Um, but it's a really problematic issue because it's, everyone loses, and it's one of those things that I felt like was a very short sighted, uh, frustrating decision. And I think, you know, they kind of overestimated themselves and kind of overextended themselves in, in, those, in those standards. I mean, it's tough because you don't know what to do, I mean, you don't have any 
functional military strength because you're not trying to create a military again because Adam's trying to create a military and you, everyone lost their fucking minds for a quick second and you know now there's tensions rising and you're kind of just like ah oh, shit what are we doing here okay you know it's tough so the only thing you could do is just do economic problems and economic uh, blockades and whatnot but it is what it is so Madison um effectively at this time is in a very particularly interesting point and what I mean by interesting point is that Jefferson he's going to make it clear he's going to start setting this precedent after two terms he's going to leave so now Madison has the door fucking wide open to become the president it's very clear that he's the actual heir apparent to the actual presidency and I don't I don't know if he actually wanted to be president um I mean, a lot of things, a lot of things he would say, a lot of things that people have said, said that he wanted to be president, et cetera, et cetera. It's just really tough because, you know, it's a lot of shit that he's going to have to deal with. And he got a firsthand seat of uh, what it meant to actually be president. And he's not a naive person. You know, don't be wrong. He ultimately would, you know, love it, accept it. And basically everyone's just kind of like pushing for him to be, you know, the next, um, next president of the United States, you know, despite all that shit happening for the most part with the embargo act, a lot of the problems and they really needed someone to, to back behind him, the democratic Republican party for the most part. Cause there's really no one else. Uh, I would say prominently, maybe Clinton, but you know, I don't think people wanted Clinton to do it. George Clinton, I believe, or one of the Clintons, I forgot who it was back then. Um, and you know, this is a very particular time because the federalists were, kind of dying at this point uh, they hadn't had a really really strong candidate um for the last couple of, of elections for the most part and for, or for the last election for the most part and you know the federal or the, the the democratic republicans are basically at a weak point within this country's history because they're not very popular for the last you know the, the, the second term of, of of thomas jefferson and they're really because they're, they, they've been looking ahead for a long time and then their idea was like okay who's gonna who's it gonna be is it monroe is it madison who's it gonna be we're trying to figure shit out clinton and ultimately at one point they do effectively decide to be to choose james madison you know short small hypochondriac james madison so madison is effectively the democratic republican candidate there's a whole bunch of people fighting for it George Clinton effectively would would run the election. He would be his vice president later on, obviously. Uh, I believe his first vice president. He kind of be salty during the entire time. Um, Thomas Jefferson is basically like, I'm not going to do it. And I'm, I endorse my buddy, James Madison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And most of the people in the Democratic uh, Republican Party, um, it wasn't unanimous. You have to understand that. Um, I mean, Madison was, I think, what was he? 56, 55, 57 years old. In his mid-50s at this point. And there was a lot of contention, you know, a lot of different states had different ideas of how, of who was going to basically be the next president. And you have to understand, there's been three presidents, two of them have been Virginians, and one of them was, was from Massachusetts. So a lot of people from other states wanted an opportunity. Clinton was from New York, and he wanted a chance to really show off his stuff, and they wanted a representative from there, and have northern interests uh, specifically. And, you know, he had a lot of opposition for the most part, and... Uh, and um, Madison, in the election of 1808, uh, it's a very interesting election. It's one of the more, I would say, kind of, I don't want to say boring. Um, boring's not the right way to fundamentally explain it. Um, but for the most part, like sectional lines, I guess you could say, it was very clear. Um, there wasn't anything specific about this election that made it very, very... <sighs> How do I explain this election? It's really hard. So let me explain it this way. Don't like it's between uh, Charles Pickney and Rufus King as the vice presidential candidate, um, as the Federalist Party candidates, and they are basically just going to town on like political propaganda to get Madison uh, not elected during this entire time uh, to be to be president for the most part. I mean, they're basically doing newspaper articles like the embargo is sickness and it weakens us. And people are blaming Madison for everything. And they're trying to pin everything on Madison for the embargo act, for instance, because this is really big, big fucking issue. And a lot of people are really mad. And um, basically, 
a lot of people are just trying to pin it on him and Jeff, and they're trying to pin it on Jefferson. So Jefferson's not happy because he's just like, why am I being blamed for shit? I'm retired. Why all gotta blame me? Even though Jefferson was still a really popular president afterwards, uh, despite you know what's happening. So at the very least, um, it depends on how you look at it. Because for some time, it was really contested of who was going to win. A lot of people were wondering what was going to happen because a lot of people thought the Democratic Republicans were really, 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 really unpopular, you know? And a lot of people were like, well, the Federalists can come in and fix things like that. So it really just depended on the popularity of the actual uh, particular individual. And, you know, for better or worse, Pickney was not someone that was a very well known person. And. James Madison was the Secretary of State, created the fucking Constitution, and just seemed like everything was aligning for him to effectively be president, no matter what was going to happen. And ultimately, the election basically went down in that particular way and path. Um, it was a little more peaceful uh, than most, for the most part. Um, other than the actual certain newspaper tax. But it was a, kind of a boring election. It was just more about like the narrative and the storyline about who's going to do it. Who's going to change this country for the better. Will it be the Democratic Republicans or will it be the Federalists? Who are going to come in and try and fix things. And ultimately the Democratic Republicans just stomped the shit out of the Federalists unfortunately. Electoral votes uh, being 122 to 27 is an overwhelming majority of the popular vote by the way. I forgot the actual percentages themselves. Around this time, too, James Monroe is really, really salty. You know, they had built a very strong friendship uh, at, while uh, Madison was a Secretary of State. And it was really, really unfortunate because um, they were really good together, I, w I would say, during his uh, entire time there. And, like, he sent them out. He sent, Matt, he sent Monroe out doing a whole bunch of different shit overseas, doing a whole bunch of different uh, negotiations and treaties and shit. And, and Monroe actually kind of threw somewhat... Someone threw his hat in the ring for the election itself, but he ultimately didn't even come close to really getting a lot of votes and felt really embarrassed by the lack of votes, actually, and felt that Jefferson was just really specifically biased uh, against him for Madison, and that really hurt their friendship. In fact, Madison wouldn't talk to Monroe for at least a couple years until uh, he would ask Monroe to be his Secretary of State. So... James Madison Jr. becomes our fourth president of the United States of America. Dun, dun, dun. So let's start off with his cabinet. Uh, it's a really interesting cabinet, to be honest with you. Um, he, he would have a couple holdovers, holdovers from Jefferson's administration, notably uh, Gallatin, who was his secretary of the treasury. Um, George Clinton would be his vice president. I mean, he ran third party and just lost him an election, so... He's not salty whatsoever. Uh, Monroe would later become his Secretary of State in 1811. And also, notably, I want to add, I'm going to get to why that's important, uh, especially for Monroe's presidency, is uh, he's the only person who actually served two, uh, two cabinet seats for the most part. He was Secretary of State and Secretary of War and duly held those positions during the War of 1812 itself. Um... He only had two Supreme Court uh, justice nominees. Uh, notably, in a similar way to Jefferson, he had actually chosen two uh, judges to specifically, there were Democratic Republicans hoping to take down the Marshall Court. I forgot their names. I, 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 wrote, I didn't even write them down because I didn't think they were that important, to be honest with you. Although everything should be important. I should be much more better than this, but I'm lazy right now. Anyways, they failed in their specific regard. And Marshall would basically turn both those judges into Federalists, because John Marshall's a very fascinating human being. I would like to point this out, too, that both of his vice presidents, because he would have two, uh, Clinton and uh, Eldridge Jerry, who, by the way, if that sounds familiar, it's because he is known for, he, he is specifically known for gerrymandering. Little tidbit. Okay, anyways, both of them would die. Uh, Clinton would die at the end of uh madison's first term and then jerry would die basically at the beginning very beginning of uh, madison's uh, second term for the most part so let's start off with the country the america before we get into the into everything economically we are in a bit of a tizzy we're still recovering from the effects of the embargo act we're trying to open shit up for the most part and um you know things are in a very tricky spot i guess you could say um, 
we're a bit stagnant, I guess. I guess I'm trying to say economically. We're trying to open stuff up, but trade is really getting is becoming a fucking problem because we can't trade with anyone because basically everyone's fighting with one another in fucking Europe because of fucking Napoleon, that short French bastard. Um, politically speaking, Federalists are kind of just going downhill. They've been going downhill for a little bit, although they would receive a bit of a resurgence in the next couple of years, which I will kind of get into for the most part because I think that's a little bit of a interesting and fascinating detail but let me start off with this the tensions with Britain these are they're very real tensions okay things are happening they've been happening from basically at the very uh, tail end of Jefferson's presidency for the most part all the attacks from British ships and whatnot and let me make it very clear Britain never left America Okay, they've been there the entire time after the end of the Revolutionary War. We've actually been having treaties with them. We're trying to figure stuff out in terms of land and whatnot. And we would be doing this for the next, like, 40 years after uh, the War of 1812 itself, notably with the, notably with the uh, Oregon Territory. It's very interesting and very fascinating because, you know... People don't understand why the War of 1812 happened and why it was a necessary thing, why people think it's the second Because some people are like, it's not the second War of Independence. And I'm like, it kind of is because they never left. And in many ways, I would argue that they were there hoping to really just retake the lands and reclaim America as their colonial power. And most notably because they were the ones really pushing a lot of the native tribes and Indians to really fight you know, American settlers and colonists, notably in like the Northwestern Territory. I mean, it's the reason why William Henry Harrison becomes such a famous fucking person. It's because of his battles with Tecumseh and all those fucking people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This happens in, like, 1809. You know, this this happens really early on, well before the war even happens. And it's these tensions that just keep rising and rising and rising and rising until the War of 1812 effectively ends up happening. So, understand that... America right now is in a very tricky spot. People are divided. You know, there's some people that are starting the cause of war, and a lot of these people would end up becoming be a lot of these people would end up being called war hawks. If you don't know what the war hawks were, it was a bunch of young upstart congressmen of this new generation of post revolutionary war uh, congressional leaders, like Henry Clay, for instance, who were basically like, "We got to go to war with Britain. We just got to fucking do it." And let's just go for it. And then there's other people who don't want to go to war. And it was a little bit divided because the country was not unified at this particular point in time. We were not the United States. We were just 13 colonies. Well, at this point, you're like about 20 states probably at this point. I forgot how many states were actually admitted at this point. Um, it's just states that are kind of like held together a little bit loosely. But no one from Virginia is going to basically have anything in common with anyone from New York. You know, that's just the way it was and how it was for the most part. No one's united. We are not a country. We are not unified, and we will not be unified until after this war. Which is why this war is very, 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 very important. So, I'm going to go from basically year to year in this new format. So, I kind of hope that you guys enjoy as I try to really keep things in line for the most part in terms of what actually happens. So, let's get started on James Madison's overall presidency in a relative timeline. So Madison finally gets inaugurated on uh, March 4th, 1809. So what is happening around this particular point? So Tecumseh and his brother, the, the prophet Ten, uh, Tensquada, I can't pronounce his name. It's a lot of, lot, lot of letters. And basically, the, the I guess you could say the confederacy of the Indian tribes in the Northwest Territory, they're really starting to encroach on American settlers in the Northwest. It's a real, real fucking problem there. And that's because, that's what makes, again, William Henry Harrison a very popular figure over there during that particular time, although his story is really fucking just all over the place and really interesting. You know, Congress effectively ends up creating, like, the in- Illinois Territory from the Indiana Territory, which is really important because... The Indiana Territory and Illinois Territory, like, they once they separate that, Indiana effectively becomes, or will become its own state, and then Illinois becomes, like, all the territories from, like, Michigan and all them. I, I, might, be getting it, I might be getting it very confused right now, but basically, it, it's starting to, to start, like, all those territories are on the path for statehood, which is really important. Uh, most of those territories coming from the Louisiana Purchase and whatnot. 
Around this time, too, the Supreme Court effectively starts doing a couple of uh, notable cases, the most notable one being United States versus Peters, where the federal government is supreme over the states, or at the very least, that was the ultimate decision that was legislated uh, or judicially uh, decided upon for the most part. Excuse me. So, what is, what is the first thing that Madison and kind of does? Um, well, first and foremost, right before he gets inaugurated, he asks Jefferson to repeal the Embargo Act, and he replaces it with what is known as his Non-Intercourse Act. So, basically, um, they're not trading with Britain or France, but they're trading with every other nation. So, they can open up trade with Russia, the Dutch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not going to really stop the ships and whatnot, but at the same time... You know, it's just going to, it makes things a little bit easier economically speaking. So things effectively start going on down the right path um, economically for this country to at least try and improve. Uh, immediately after, uh, James Madison starts sending uh, a couple of uh, uh, envoys for the most part with Britain. Uh, specifically Britain because they're the ones imprisoning us and doing the, the lion's share of the... Uh, uh, of the attacks for the most part and it's known as M- madison issues this 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 potential agreement called the the uh erskina or er, er, erskine agreement um it's basically saying hey guys if you basically just stop doing the shit you're doing uh we will revoke this embargo act and we'll just go back to trading but you guys gotta stop doing this okay and you know madison's like okay i think we have a deal because the british uh, um, ambassador's like, okay, yes, sir, we will properly do this for you. No biscuits, okay? No biscuits. It'll be cookies for y'all. And then when, when the guy goes back to the to, to the British Prime Minister, he's like, no, we're going biscuits all the way. And he basically just reneges on the treaty. And You want to talk about inflaming tensions. It's shit like that that would really just piss me off. You know, a lot of people off. And Madison was no different. You know, he wasn't a war hawk, but he was someone that was basically like, we got to do something because they're not going to stop. And, we, and the whole purpose of the fucking federal government I created is to do this, is to combat what is happening right now. And he is not happy. He is very mad. And a lot of people hear about this, and they're not happy, and they're all mad. And this is this is like one of those things that really starts with the Warhawks ultimately um, ends up, you know, being one of, like, the deciding factors for it, okay? So a lot of, so during this time, things happen. America's improving, uh, notable events, I would say, is Thomas Paine dies. So that's a really fucking sad story. The guy who wrote Common Sense, uh, which really ignited revolution within this country, passes away. But around this time, a couple of notable things happen. You know, like the first census comes around, and there's 7 million people in the country by about 1812, with a million of them being slaves. So that's really interesting. Um, tensions are starting to happen more so, more so, because tensions don't stop. Indians keep attacking. And now there's tensions in the south, mainly with Spain and West Florida, because that particular area is really contested. It's always been contested because Spain and France have this. Well, um, Spain at this point, I, I believe, was a colony, or uh, or under the control of France. So when they agreed to the whole uh, Louisiana territory, America thought that you know they had. Florida and, and and that Spanish territory, or at least West Florida, and Florida's like, no, we got our own thing, and it's really political because they don't want to, because America doesn't want to attack France and claim that land as their own, because then they're going to be an imperial power, and they're like, no, we're just taking back our land, but that's not how everyone else is going to see it, and vice versa. So it's really just like a game of weird chicken for the most part, I guess in some way, shape, and form, and and uh, you know, Mad- Madison's just preparing, you know. In a lot of ways, you can say Madison's really preparing for the war because he ends up authorizing a bunch of different acts, uh, calls for the country to have at least 100,000 militiamen in every single state or whatever to be prepared in, just in case for the call of war. And he really attempts to try and pass legislation uh, in order to get soldiers uh, implemented with the actual military itself, have a standing army of volunteers and regulars. You have to understand Madison as a president is re- a really fascinating president because he is doing everything he humanly can to not be like Jefferson or Adams or whatnot. He's the one president that literally goes through the legislature, through Congress, through every single aspect, through all the checks and balances, 
and does so in a way that it's both admirable and fucking irritatingly frustrating at the very same time because it's he doesn't get as many things done and at one point when escalations are rising to a point where war is an inevitability you got to do something about it and this it's things like this that I, I admire madison and i also am frustrated with madison because if someone's going to break down my door and they're trying to kill me i'm i i don't want to have to call the police i'd rather just go get the gun myself and then just protect myself you know what i'm saying it's kind of in that mindset of what i'm looking at it for the most part and it's not, it's difficult too because it, it's not like someone's breaking down your door or broke down. It's someone trying to break down your door. So you're trying to decide, you know, do you have enough time? Madison is not the best decision maker as a president. And that's probably one of his biggest faults. You know, he's very apprehensive and very deferential to a lot of things, which is fascinating because he's a little bit of the opposite in uh, when he was a secretary of state. And it's not... And I mean, it's, and I mean, it's a little bit different, I guess, being a Secretary of State versus President, because as the Secretary of State, he's basically just like, oh, you should probably do this, and kind of just going along with it. And then if he didn't really decide, he's going to go along with Jefferson regardless. And Madison's just like, oh, it's all on me now. <laughs> so who am I going to fucking? I mean, it's a big. Re- this is a big reason why he brought Monroe on, mainly because he's going to be the closest advisor to him. And it was a really big, uh, big moment when he was actually able to get Monroe to be his uh, Secretary of State. So. What else happens around this time? Because by the time the West Florida tensions occur, um, um, it's it's the beginning of 1810. And 1810, some things happen. John Marshall does the Fletcher versus Peck, uh, Peck case, uh, finding attempts to rectify the Yazoo land fraud scheme and a violation of contract rights. And that, in a lot of ways, is the functional reason why when Madison gets his opportunity to appoint Supreme Court justices, he effectively tries to make it Democratic Republican uh, nominees instead. And that case in particular is a really fascinating one because it really just goes against what Madison is. Um, Madison during this time is trying to do a couple things. One, he's trying to build a military. He's trying to figure out, can we do a declaration of war while also trying to, at the very least, uh, pass some non-intercourse agreements with France for the most part. He wants France, um, for the most part, to just stop doing shit. And it's known as Macon's Bill Number Two. It's it's, it's to replace the whole non-intercourse act that Jefferson signed in the office. And this basically allowed American ships to carry French or English goods while barring, you know, the belligerent powers from the American ports. So basically saying that, look, man, we can trade with you. You can't come to us, but you know what? If you really want our goods and services, stop doing the shit you're doing, okay? And they, for the most part, kind of agree to it. Uh, they, they, It's kind of like a weird, like, okay, I'll sign it, but then I'm not actually going to appease it. I'm just going to do this so we can get some of your stuff and then just keep doing the same shit we're going to keep doing, and you're just going to have to deal with it for the most part. Um... And it's really difficult too. And immediately soon after, in in later 1810, um, it's known as a Cador letter that notifies the American minister in France that the decrees of Berlin, Milan will be repealed. And they effectively, if, at this point, Britain revokes its orders in council, and effectively, the United States is based, or the basically Britain's like, okay, if you guys you guys are going to have to do what we're going to do for the most part, okay? And if you don't, we will restrict trade from you, okay? And America's kind of like, what the fuck? What are we doing here, people? And, again, increased tensions at this particular point for the most part within uh, this country with Britain because they're basically just stoking the native fires both in the south and specifically the northwest territory with Tecumseh. It's a very, very, very tricky time in this country's history. So the latter part of 1810 is really occupied by West Florida and all that bullshit that's happening. Um, to put it plainly, Spain's like, okay, fuck you guys. <laughs> and Madison's like, can we just clarify all this shit? I don't have to invade you guys. And he's they're not answering their phones for the most part. So Madison basically is just like, fuck it. I don't care go and invade just go occupy the territory and it pisses off a lot of federalists who say it's on all oh, non non-constitutional etc 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 yada 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 but tensions are rising there that will eventually lead to like you know the second seminal wars and all that and it's a big problem 
I would say the latter part of 1810 and the beginning part of 1811 is really just dominated specifically by trade as both America, all these people, they're trying to figure out what the fuck they're going to be doing because, like, everyone wants to trade. Everyone wants to figure shit out. And America, Britain, and France are kind of, like, stuck in this weird part for the most part. So France basically says, we'll stop attacking you guys we'll give you our word fingers crossed but for the most part we'll give you our word and that pisses off britain so fucking much that they're basically just like you want to go to war we'll fucking go to war y'all you know and they basically start this whole non-intercourse thing again with with britain and they basically just say fuck you guys meanwhile soon after france is like "Uh, we totally didn't promise that we're gonna start stop seizing ships and shit and French just basically keep attacking and taking American ships, which is not really good. And after that, for the most part, a lot of things happen. Within the next year and a half, a lot of events will happen and transpire that effectively make war inevitable. First and foremost, uh, the Bank of the United States, the actual charter, uh, stops. It, it effectively closes. They've, they've they chose not to recharter the national bank so the effect of the economy it makes it a little bit difficult um you know most people would then have to just go to state banks and you know they really couldn't produce a lot of their money so all the money that we had in our treasury etc cetera, etc cetera, is really all the money that we have in our treasury it's a really complicated economic system and i don't fully fucking understand it but for the most part the economy really struggles uh for some time um, at least until uh, the second national bank really opens up. And so and it, it's a bit of a tricky time. And Madison, for the most part, is enti- it's unfortunate because his entire presidency is just dominated by the interactions with Britain, with war for the most part, and it's really, really difficult. So, I mean, the tensions just keep getting worse and worse and worse. So after dismissing his Secretary of State, Robert Smith, he, ac- he asked James Monroe in a letter, hey, bro, bruh. Can you help me out? Can you be my, my secretary of state? And Monroe's like, look, man, I want to retire, but you know what? If you really need me in the betterment of my country, I will fucking do it. I will be your secretary of state. So he ends up becoming the secretary of state. And a lot of people are kind of like, oh, really? You're going to choose me? Just take-? Don't tell me he's going to be the next president. Uh, you know? And it's it's still a bit of a, a, a difficult time, obviously, but tensions continue to rise, unfortunately. Attitudes towards Britain just keep getting much more warlike and the federalists basically are capitalizing in a lot of senses in uh, at least the idea of uh, anti-war so this is basically like the anti-war parties the federalists and democratic republicans they basically take sides on war versus no not war and it's actually a bit of a contentious uh point in time and congress would not allow war although uh, they would basically be alluding to that for the most part and uh, they basically a lot of stuff is happening a lot of political shit is happening too and Madison's just trying to later on in the year of uh, 1811 just be like hey man war is going to happen we got to do some shit or else you know the war is going to come to us you know British excuse me British just keep attacking all the ships um, and they're growing much bolder I would say in their intervention in America for the most part I mean, the Battle of, of Tippecanoe happens in uh, 1811, and for the most part, everyone's just getting sick of these native raids, and they're pleading in the Northwest Territory, hey, can you guys do something for the most part? Because it's been really, really fucking annoying, okay? So, basically, they sent a couple of um, a bills into actual Congress itself, like the Army Bill, the Navy Bill, and for the most part, it's a bit of a contentious point that Madison's trying to do with with, with with Congress to try and get both these bills passed. They want to strengthen the Army and the Navy. They say no to the Navy, and they say yes to the Army, only in a limited capacity and, and more of a protectionist kind of thing. I mean, it's unfortunate. So they basically just say, hey, you can increase the Army of 10,000 to 25,000, and that's literally it. So once that happens, Madison's like, fuck it. We will do what we can. So just go for it, go for it, and let's just fucking do it, okay? So anyways, 1812, a lot of stuff happens. Um, Governor <laughs> Governor uh, 
Elbridge Gary, who would be his vice president, starts what would be known as gerrymandering. I think that's really fascinating, and he ends up getting a bunch of congressional seats, ends up basically and just being an important individual in this particular time. And tensions just really, really, really rises, okay? And I'm talking about, like, tensions all across the world are really rising, okay? And when once 1812 hits, shit really hits the fan. I mean, Napoleon invades Russia at this point, so you have to understand that. And U.S. and the United States and Great Britain effectively will go to war with each other. I mean, Gazar Alexander the first with John Quincy Adams in Russia is like, Hey, man, you guys are right. You're like, like two siblings fighting, trying to mediate shit. How does it happen, though? Because it happens, for the most part, with... Um, he begins drafting war messages to Congress in the middle... Of, like, b- right before the summer. And then he effectively, by June 1st, is like, We are going to war. I don't know why I'm talking like Kennedy. But we're going to... They, they basically immediately, you know, call for war. An action for war. And a lot of people are not happy about this that are the anti-war party, you know? And the United States officially declares war on Britain in on january 18th 1812 and around this time they begin you know creating a lot a shit ton of militias and attempting to create some form of a standing army what is the war of 1812 the war of 1812 in a lot of ways has been described as the as the second war of independence i would just say to an extent it is i would say it's the war that made america america like modern day america there's no unity within this country until this war actually happens and i would say it's the true war that tested america's metal against our enemies and what we were capable of and i think the war of 1812 is a deeply fascinating war that i'm going to go and do my own deep dive on in another episode and i will explain it very briefly here the war of 1812 is very interesting it's basically britain uh, British redcoats and, and basically just native Indians attacking settlers and muskets and an even more disorganized army for the majority of the first year or two of the actual war's existence. It really isn't until 1815, I mean outside of obviously some victories in 18, you know, 12, 13, 14, that um, we really get our shit together and things start really changing in um the direction positively for this country you know and it's also a very interesting war because i think this war is the war that really pushes the trust and security of the federal government i think more than anything else because everything was just states rights and people were just doing their thing and once they burn the fucking capital down and the white house down things really change and i think that's a really important detail that i think people need to understand and really need to know so I would say there's about like three or four theaters, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, we had our naval theater, which was kind of insane because we only had like 15 ships and Britain had like three fucking hundred. And we somehow won a couple battles. I don't know how that happened. But then you have like the Northwestern Theater with William Henry Harrison and they have the Southern Theater with Andrew, Andrew Jackson. And then you had like the Virginia kind of like, um, you know, Chesapeake Bay, Massachusetts kind of area, like like the middle mid mid east middle of the country i guess at this point um where like i mean the most notable thing in the middle part of the country would basically just be the the burning of the of the capital i would say and i would say the bombing of you know maryland not maryland what was it it's uh i believe it was in the city of maryland it was, it was a, a fort henry um where most notably our our national anthem comes from oh i i'll just tell that story right now it's kind of pretty and beautiful that britain you know the the british are just bombing the hell out of the fort and they're fighting for the most part and like you know um the francis got key he's his lawyer i believe and he's a he's like a amateur poet and he goes and sees the uh destruction and everything and it's a brilliant fight and battle and America stands strong, and when you see all the dust settle, all he, all he sees is, like, an American flag with, like, 15 stripes and stars, and there's really no, like, specific amount. Like, American flags really differed, but for the most part, the relatively similar design was still there, so it's kind of interesting. Um, a lot of things happen within the next couple years all across the world. Um, like, obviously, uh, 
during over the course of this war because the, once the war actually starts this would effectively just consume Madison's presidency and while and while he ends up getting reelected uh, I should probably sorry let, let me back up a little bit first off the first couple of things that happen are uh, this the surrender of Detroit which is just a fucking embarrassment basically the British just go and take Detroit and General Hull I believe is just like oh I, I give up don't don't oh, don't attack me don't attack me okay okay you don't have don't attack me um and around this time too when he does do this whole declaration of war the election's upcoming and the election's a very tricky election too because this election is basically just going to decide whether america is for the war or if it's for you know anti-war ironically the person who's going against is, is this young man from new york who will be governor is uh, dewitt clinton he he was a Democratic Republican, but he's basically representing the Federalists for the most part. It's a very tricky situation. And he represented Northern interests as well, so it's a Northern southern, southern thing again. And this basically is literally just like, you know, if you're the incumbent, it's going to be tough because all the negatives are going to be on you, you know. And, and if you're basically an anti-war person, you're not going to like Madison, and then vice versa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So whoever won this was really going to decide the war, for the most part, whether we go to war or not. And Madison, thankfully, would win out. But this would be notably the most contested election uh, from, I guess, un- at least until 1828. Between Jefferson and uh John Quincy Adams, this would be the closest. Madison would win the electoral vote 128 to 89, but far more of a closer popular vote within the margins of 1 to 2%. And for the most part, this election was just more about the the whole issues with the war itself, so it wasn't like anything personal, although the attacks obviously were personal, because he's like, War Madison! And it is what it is. Anyways... Madison eventually gets reelected, and once he starts his next term the following year, shit really hits the fan for the most part. Madison's cabinet is really frustrating because they go all over the place. They go back and forth. He's replacing a shit ton of members during this period in time, and it's really difficult. I mean, he ends up replacing a Secretary of War like far, like three or four times. Um, he ends up bringing John Armstrong in, who ends up being a confusing and relatively ineffective um, Secretary of War, which case, you know, James Monroe would effectively take over on two separate occasions, and it's really complicated. Anyways, basically, Russia at this point is like, hey guys, you want to, like, stop fighting each other? And they try and do some peace treaties, but, you know, Brit- Great Britain's like, oh, we're going full blower- full bore at this point. We want to fucking win, and we're fucking just going to go for it, okay? So, the, the actual battles that are occurring right now, Battle of the Thames in the Northwest Territory uh, with William Henry Harrison, where the, notably uh, Tecumseh would die. There's a whole bunch of different battles. The Battle of, uh, of Put-in Bay, uh, where a bunch of warships would basically end up fighting each other. And it, Madison, as, as the president, is basically not really able to do a whole lot other than just try and manage the situation that's growing on. Um, you know, the, our economy's not doing too well, and it's only made a little bit more f- more frustrated with an, a complete and total embargo on all British goods, on all British uh, colonies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're basically just stopped trade of entirely of Great Britain what's, whatsoever. And things are getting really, really tricky. We're, we're not, we don't have a lot of money. We can't really be paying people. We can't keep taxing people. If we don't have money to bring in, then we don't, we just don't have anything. You know, and that was the purpose of the national bank too, was just so we can create line of credit, so that we can basically just okay, we can pay for shit now, and we can. So Madison's basically like, uh, well, technically speaking, James Monroe, who's eventually going to be the Secretary of War, and I, I believe he at this particular point in time he is in 1813, 1814 for a very brief period of time, is like, dude, you gotta do something. We gotta like establish the national bank. Come on, we we push through, homie. We got we we gotta pay for stuff. So Madison really pushes for it, you know, and he really pushes for um, the National Bank to create to, to fund this war. I would like to point out too, if you don't know who he is, but Simon Bolivar becomes the, the 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 dictator of Venezuela around this particular time too. I just want to point that out because I think it's it's kind of fascinating that all these events are all concurrently happening 
uh, around one another. I mean, Mexico would literally declare its independence from Spain and then begin the whole issues of their own independence and then Texas annexation and all that. It's all happening around this particular point in time. So, basically, the war is very up and down. You know, we've had some victories and we've had some losses, and it's only made much more uh, difficult because once Napoleon effectively starts losing, he's because at this point around 1814, 1815, uh, Napoleon's just going to keep losing. He's going to keep losing, um, and effectively Napoleon was it? I think by by the middle of 1814, Napoleon ends up basically just losing to the British and. Great Britain just sends fucking all their soldiers into uh, America at this point. And when they send all their soldiers to America, we are not functionally ready. Yeah, Napoleon, his empire collapses in March. And then his final battles will be uh, later that summer. And it is around this particular time uh, uh that his generals are also changing too, James Madison. And James Madison and James Monroe, you know, they were politically motivated individuals, but the both of them, and specifically Monroe, when, you know, war calls, we're not going to do this whole political thing. We're just going to choose the best people regardless of how we feel about them, you know. Um, Major General was one of the big big positions, and they effectively just give Andrew Jackson the role for the most part. And although it would be costly because it makes Andrew Jackson like the rising star, it's the thing that probably helps him really functionally solidify and win the war. More battles start happening. More battles start happening. The British troops from Britain finally arrive to America. And they go hard. And they attack Washington, D.C. They march in, and they start setting fires to everything. The Capitol building, the White House, etc., etc. Most of us know that. And it's been really difficult because we didn't have a standing army and our militias were not strong enough. And in fact, we just didn't even attempt to fight because their army was too big and we were not ready. So we had, a lot of people ended up being evacuated. Madison wasn't even there. He was evacuated uh, long before that. Notably, Dolly Madison was there, though. And she actually ended up saving... Uh, she resisted. She ended up trying to help people there. She left with a with the actual portrait of George Washington that had basically, thank God she did. She was awesome. And a bunch of other people ended up staying. Notably Monroe would basically help with the city's evacuation. And once the troops entered the city, they torched everything. It was a very, very difficult time. Because once, once the city was basically uh, sacked, everyone came back and everyone's just basically like, oh... Oh my god. Oh my god. And that un- that was a bit of a unifying moment in a lot of ways cuz immediately right after they all those soldiers basically go uh I believe they go north into Baltimore where uh Fort Henry is at basically and that's where the Star Spangled Banner ends up becoming, you know, the the big thing too right after that. As soon as that happens, Madison's basically like, "All right, I'm done with this shit." Monroe, you're going to be my Secretary of War. He immediately fires John Armstrong, who's an effect, ineffectual uh, Secretary of War. So, James Monroe holds both dual positions, and I'll probably go way more in-depth into this, but without James Monroe, I don't know if we have the reinvigorated force, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and because they probably would have just sacked Washington again and just destroyed everything, but... Monroe protects it with uh, the reinforcements that he ends up bringing in and basically just puts people in the proper positions and supplies them to the best of his ability. Monroe really is the tipping point that really makes the war succeed and ends up becoming the, the prominent individual that would effectively be the next person in line for the presidency. So, what happens after this? Once he's appointed there, he, Madison is just replacing everybody. Dallas, uh, Alexander Dallas becomes the Secretary of the Treasury. Um... He has a whole bunch of other people that end up becoming uh, appointed. I think that's like the, the third time he ends up replacing a secretary of the treasury. It's a very difficult time for the most part. But once Monroe becomes president, things start shifting. Okay, Both people in Britain and America, they're fighting each other. And it's very clear that America's not going to back down. They do well enough to a point where Britain's like, uh, this might not be worth it to, to do this. So they actually agree with Russia to help who's going to help immediately uh, mediate um, the peace treaty. And it goes well. 
and it goes well for the most part and it's actually kind of beautiful in a lot of ways because they actually have some camaraderie and they're kind of just like hey guys i know we just burnt down washington and you guys did all this stuff antebellum can we go back to normal and for the first time it actually feels like we actually have some positive relations with great britain for the most part um and effectively they mediate and the treaty of ghent is signed and the war is effectively technically over although it's what would not be ratified for at least another um another couple of months i believe and then the battle of you know new orleans occurs and everyone's like oh my god the battle of new orleans it was kind of pointless because the war is already over and i'm just like no the war was not over that treaty was not ratified people you have to understand that that's a really big key that people forget can you just imagine if we had lost uh the battle of new orleans and like the mississippi rivers open and all that and they have the control of it like negotiations are going to be much different i'll put it that way they might just keep going and just retake us over again and we'll be eating biscuits again it's very important that people understand that is what i'm trying to say so say what you will about andrew jackson but that battle is a necessary battle to protect our civil liberties against britain in a time when the war was technically not over the war would officially be over on february 13th 1815 and that has to be very 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 clear uh, soon after, too, uh, Thomas Jefferson would sell his library to refill all the books uh, that had been burned uh, when they basically just torched the fucking uh, library. I'll also point out, too, that soon after, Napoleon would also come back and do this whole thing. So it, it was a little bit of a, of, of a rough time for Britain and all the other countries. Cause Napoleon's trying to come back, and <laughs> to put it plainly, it's the Battle of Waterloo. I think it's really interesting. It makes me want to listen to ABBA. Anyways, War of 1812 ends, and what happens? Well, technically speaking, he goes to war again. The War on Algiers. It, it it's it's a it's it's not really anything. It's more it's more more about pirates again, and that war is really quickly. But for the most part. America and Britain would basically re- just be trying to have relations for the most part. The rest of Madison's presidency is him just trying to clean up stuff, fix things before the next election, as he intends to finally retire at the age of, what, 60, 65, 64? And Britain and, and America, they start uh, normalizing relations. Uh, Galat and the former Secretary of Treasury would actually be the one person to really be the ambassador to really start communications with all this. And at this point, realizing the, nece- the necessity of the of the of, of the national bank, uh, Madison resigns the bill charter that would effectively last for uh, twenty one years, and in which it becomes a big issue in Andrew Jackson's presidency, as we will come to see. Soon after, though, things start coming back to normal. People start doing their own things, and effectively, Madison gets to just enjoy trying to rebuild the country because the country at least from 1815 to 1816 are economically becoming a little bit better you know we haven't really felt the 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 fires of when we have to actually pay our debt yet because the national bank and we are rebuilding but for the most part people are basically taking a a lot of you know loans and whatnot in order to help sufficiently uh, help themselves for the most part financially and it works for the most part to stimulate the economy because we're basically just broke and fucked up at the hell and i mean it would lead to the panic of 1819 but that's just more about you know the post-war economics really catching up to us among a shit ton of other things uh for the most part soon after monroe would win the presidency and james madison would leave the presidency and he has a i don't know how i feel about his presidency because it's really difficult um mainly due to the realities of his entire presidency is just dominated by war does that make him a bad president or a good president i don't know it's really difficult to explain people's presidencies but I, it's a conflicting presidency you know economy tanked and a lot of a lot of stuff happened but do, can I, could I really blame him for a lot of the stuff that was going to happen? Because tensions were going to rise regardless, you know? And it's stuff like this that happens that makes things really gray and you don't know. And he's probably one of the more grayer presidents because I don't know how to sufficiently 
explain his presidency other than him just being a wartime president for the entire time. I think he could have done things a lot differently, but for the most part, what do you expect? That being said, he did get us through the war, so I will give him props and credit for that. Fourth President James Madison would finally retire and effectively leave in March of 1817. So despite the conflicting presidency, what does James Madison do when he retires? He does a lot of things, to be honest with you. He, he goes home, he retires to his Montpelier estates um, to be with his family members that are still alive. Um, you know, nieces and nephews, a whole bunch of kids are on the farm. Um, his brother, for the most part, did the best he could, and his family did the best they could in order to sufficiently keep the farm going. And you know they're going to be hit with the with the economic problems of the Panic of eighteen nineteen, among other things, and a whole bunch of issues that will arise with debt from his stepson, his family, et cetera, et cetera. And he and his wife Dolly basically just lived the rest of their lives on that farm and being with family for the most part. Madison did own slaves, but if you want to know how I feel about the slavery issue with Madison, you can just listen to the Jefferson one real quick when I bring up Sally Hemings and the whole slavery issue because just like Matt, um, just like Jefferson, Madison would basically fall under the same problems that Jefferson would. He actually attempted numerous times to free his slaves, but he could not financially do it, especially with many people and many family members i mean hundreds of family members that relied on the financial income of the plantation and whatnot and he just could not let his slaves go at the very least and you know a lot of them would be split up unfortunately and it is what it is but you know i'd rather not let my family starve and you know what not let them take on pelier away and i think they would have to sell the farm anyways afterwards um almost just like monticello and it's, it's a little unfortunate, and it is what it is, you know? And I don't condone it, obviously. History is very subjective and objective, and this is one aspect that, you know, it's a tough one. But you have to understand the economic times, especially back then, when everyone is broke at that particular point, and we can't really function as a society and an economy, and we're just trying to get back things back on normal. And, it, I mean, you want to talk about, like, the rich people were hurt, too, during the Panic of 1819 and all those different economic disasters that would happen so it's not just you know the poor people for the most part it's the rich people too and it is what it is massa was not the greatest farmer okay let's just be honest with that he was not and he, he his slaves were really good and helped them and you know they made some money but they would also lose a lot of stuff because his stepson was being a drunk gambling you know basically having sex with really sultry women and whatnot which you know sounds like a good tuesday night i'm just kidding Anyways, they, he's, for the most part, is trying to enjoy himself. You know, once you devote 50 plus years of your life to, to all of this, it's, it's a lot. And to finally get a chance to retire, reflect on your life, and to figure things out, it's a really good peaceful moment for Madison. And he never really got a chance to do so. And for the most part, a lot of these presidents end up basically getting this opportunity and go about thinking in the exact same way. And I think Madison's probably thinking kind of in the sense of no regrets. It is what it is. Life is beautiful. You just do what you got to do. He was much more optimistic in his uh, older age for the most part, I think. And I think he was much more happier in his uh, much older age. I think it's just being with his wife, Dolly, who's who's like 15 to 16 years younger than him, I think, uh, by the way. Not to mention, too, he's like, I thought I was going to be dying at 20 and I'm 60, so I don't know what the fuck you know, I've been doing, why God bless me with all this stuff, etc., etc. So, other than, you know, him relaxing, maybe just reflecting, he's also thinking about legacy. All these founding fathers have a fundamental understanding of legacy, what it means, and how they're going to be perceived, you know, and there's a whole bunch of stories about Madison, you know, editing some of his documents and whatnot to make it appear much more favorable in a historical view and context, Two things I just want to point out here. You have to understand that a lot of what our historical analysis is, is really on these documentations, okay? How we perceive these founding fathers is what, you know, they all wrote to each other. It's all subjective, and at times it could be 
misleading, a non-accurate statement, you know? Maybe this person wrote something that wasn't really a truthful thing in case, historically speaking, they could, you know, put them in a better light. And I'm not saying it's always, you know, I'm not. But I'm just saying that, like, it's a very real possibility, which is why when I say, you know, something, like, history is not fully concrete, you know? What we know about what we know about them in terms of the writings and whatnot is what we know. And it's just up to us to decide if we want to believe that this is their actual reality and truth of what happened. And for the most part, I would probably say 99% of the things that we know and have uncovered are pretty much, for the most part, very true. Like, because, you know, when you have 15 different people basically saying the, the exact same thing, they're all not coordinating with one another, it's, it's, it's generally accepted as the truth. So, you know. That being said, you know, Madison was a big proponent individual of this historical context and legacy. And it wasn't for mischievous means, I would say. I'm not saying he's gun- he's not a mischievous person, you know, and no one's perfect. But Madison mainly did it just so he can secure enough money for his wife because they're, they're pretty broke for the most part. And memoirs of his papers are going to sell for a lot. They would sell for the equivalent of, I guess, modern-day money, like $6 million. And it was a very lucrative thing that Madison was doing to basically make sure his wife was going to be taken care of because it's clear that their son isn't going to be really functioning as a member of society. So around like the 1820s and whatnot, uh, Madison's getting older. His health is slightly deteriorating, but for the most part, he's been remarkably healthy for a man in his now roughly about his 70s. He ends up taking over for Jefferson as the rector or the head of the University of Virginia that he created at, at uh, I think, 26, 27 and you know he's there for jefferson you know even even the last couple days of his uh last years of his life too and he really just takes over that position and just kind of just hanging around the farm you know you have to understand i think it's really fascinating um james madison is the last of the founding fathers i generally am saying that the founding fathers being i would say from you know the Revolutionary War to the Constitutional Convention. I would probably say the founding of this fundamental country. James Matt, James Monroe would be the actual youngest last one because he's you know the fifth president, but he dies before Madison, unfortunately. Madison's the last one. He dies in 1836, and I'll get to that in a little bit. I just want to point out, I think it's interesting. You know, a lot of people, um, when we think of his, like history and historic and historians look at history. You know, Madison's alive during a lot of the constitutional problems that this country's facing. Um, you know, like the nullification crisis happens, and he's still alive at this point. You know, and like obviously they do some of their input, but for the most part, they generally stay retired because they want to retire and let the next generation take over. I guess I'm trying to say it's. I think it's interesting where like if people are like the nullification crisis is, uh, is unconstitutional, but you know the guy who wrote the Constitution is still around, so you know why not ask him? I just think that's a really fascinating little thought topic um, uh, to think about for the most part, you know. And he'd be, he would actually be a really, uh, he would input for a little bit. He'd input for like you know guys like Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams for the most part in some of their. Um, particular issues and questions but for the most part they understood and just let james madison finally and functionally retire he would live out his life for quite a long time you know the man who was supposed to die at a very young age would live to be 85 years old dying in 1836 he was i think eating breakfast and he smiled at his grandchild or niece or nephew one of his favorites and basically just collapsed after that unfortunately How do I feel about James Madison? How is his legacy and what is he for the most part? How should he be remembered functionally? I think any man that can create the most modern form of functional government deserves to be high on any list of great historical figures of all time. You have to understand why the Constitution is so important. The Constitution isn't just checks and balances. It's a fundamental understanding of human nature and people. Okay? The reason why we are not a democracy fundamentally is because majority rule should not supersede every single individual's, you know, personal unalienable rights, you know. If the fifty one percent do not get to tell and dictate what the other forty nine percent get to do. 
in any country in any particular situation it should be for the most part fair and the constitution for the most part is the most fair checks and balances system that we have functionally ever come up with is it perfect no but it's one that's lasted for quite a long time in a world that constantly especially now has somehow stopped going to war with with each other to stop fighting each other has stopped really trying to destroy each other for the most part you know like it's no surprise that like once you know the turn of the 20th century wars were just going left and right with a whole bunch of people fighting each other in little skirmishes and etc etc rebellions like things happen in the 20th century that would have taken like a thousand years but it still would have happened because people fight each other and whatnot and my point being that in our ever increasing technological society that to create the government that we've created to basically stop us from doing the things becoming this monster you know authority like authoritarian regime although let's be honest things are not looking too positively right now not because of trump but because of like you know democrats i would probably say they're, they're going a little bit crazy um but for the most part i guess what i'm trying to say is is the level of impact that just him doing this and creating this and being the instigator of all of this is insurmountable that alone makes him want high up just on any historical totem pole you want to basically put him on but other than that what is his legacy you know, and I'm not saying that the Constitutional Convention shouldn't be his legacy, but I mean, this man was basically he was the Secretary of State for Thomas Jefferson. This guy was um, the leader of the Democratic Republican Party. This guy was our fourth president, who basically was the president who oversaw the the Second War of Independence. You know, what does that mean? Who is James Madison? You know, and I think the best answer I can give you is. He is a man of brilliance, ideas, and I think someone who really understood people and human nature in a lot of instances and in a lot of ways, but was very scared of that human nature in a lot of instances and in a lot of ways. So much more so that inaction in his time, mainly as president, I would probably say, uh, led to things being a lot more difficult, a lot more... I guess you could say legacy ruining in many aspects and in many forms and in many ways, you know. He's not a perfect man. He's not a perfect individual. No one is perfect by any stretch of the imagination, you know. And and Madison is not perfect, obviously, as as I'm pointing this particular thing out. But, you know, there's, there's there, strength, I think, is really necessary to really become a president. You need stand up for yourself you need to invoke specific change you know there's a reason why despite literally creating one of the greatest single documents of all time and one of the single greatest forms of government of all time that he isn't really remembered all that much you know when you think of the war of 1812 it's a whole bunch of different things that you tend to think of and you tend to think of like andrew jackson who gets much more of the fame or william henry harrison you probably think of monroe before you think of madison as the actual president during this particular time and era it's unfortunate you know he's someone that just gets lost in the weeds i mean just the amount of effort he has put in into really shaping this country you know i just don't know like how many people can say that they've shaped this country in the way that James Madison has fundamentally and functionally shaped this country. He's an important figure in our country's history, and despite the relative conf- like just conflicting ideas of his presidency and how I look at it, it is undeniable that he is one of the great historical figures in this country's history and that we should never forget about him that we should constantly be reminded of him and that the fact that he's not really remembered in the way that he probably should be and the way that he properly should be is a little bit frustrating a little bit sad and i hope that you know just like a lot of the other founding fathers that have had their reputations rehabilitated that madison has the opportunity for him to have his reputation rehabilitated as well one can only hope 
because at the very least I think people should know about Madison and to get their own perspective and opinion of him who knows I might be wrong I probably am wrong but you know what I hope people find out who he is and I find out what he's done because he has created the government that we live under today thank you guys hope you guys liked it and wait for the next episode later Thank you.